This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Hey. And today's guest, we've got Baz Rice. How are we, Baz? Hey, thanks. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, thank you, James. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming on. All the way from New Zealand. SES involved with Blackwater, which is one of the toughest security firms on the planet, I believe. Is that correct? It was back in the day, yes, during those times. But we'll promote your book straight away. We are Blackwater. Can you give us a rough what a book's about? Okay, so I'll, I'll just go back to sort of why I wrote it for a start. Mm. Okay, I was, I was in Blackwater there for... Uh, the early part 2003 up to 2005 in Iraq and um, when I left you know I, I was always getting questions about what it was like working for Blackwater and every time you mentioned Blackwater people would sort of like oh you know you'd work from work for the devil and no it wasn't like that at all for all of us who were who were part of it um, so for there was a, there was a several reasons one was to sort of get the record straight from someone who, who had worked in it. And being a non-American, I had a better a view. Then I wasn't sort of tinted with the, you know, with the patriotism and the flag waving and everything like that. For me, it was a job. And um, secondly, um, I thought it would be a good sort of bit of therapy. You know, I'd, I'd suffering from PGSD and uh, other different bits and pieces, and I sort of started writing it down. But initially, I, I didn't think I had anything worth sort of telling. Um, and a good friend of mine, uh he said, you know, just start writing. He's an Academy Award writer uh, for movies and stuff. He said, once you start writing, it will just start to flow. So, of course, I, I reluctantly started, and, yeah, it just flowed. It's just, it's just all came, came running out. And things I thought I had quite successfully buried with uh, sort of alcohol and everything else, so not to bring up, all came sort of flooding out. And my initial draft ended up being like, you know, almost like 250,000 words of just ramblings, you know, sort of, but it made sense to me. Um, and it was actually quite therapeutic, you know, so that was the reason for the book. Um, then I got introduced to a, a, a very good writer, military writer by the name of Damien Lewis. He writes a lot of books about the SAS. He read it and he read, read my ramblings and, uh, he said he would ghostwrite and and fix it up for me, put it into a book format, which he did, and cut it down to a to a readable size. And uh, he said, "No, there's a message here, and you know he'd like to see it published." And so, uh, working closely with him, and over a number of years of edits and rewrites and uh, stepping away from it because it became a little bit emotional, and then coming back to it, uh, we got an offer from Bikeback Publishing in London, and they uh, and they published the book last year. So, you know. That's how the sign up kind of evolved. Congratulations. Where can people buy the book, Buzz? You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on uh, Biteback uh, Publishing through their website. Uh, s- different book sh- uh, stores are around. Um, it's out in the UK now. It's out in Australia and New Zealand now, and, and it'll be out in the US uh, in May. Before we get into everything, no, Buzz, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get more of a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Well, I grew up in a small town on the east coast of New Zealand called Gisborne. 
The uh, it was quite an isolated town. You had you had several options if you wanted to go somewhere. Um, you become a forestry worker. You become a farmer, or you can become uh, and join the army. And uh, the army in those days, like we're talking about the eighties, was the only option you had to really leave New Zealand. None of us could afford to fly to New Zealand, and if we did, it was to uh, Australia. And if you really ventured outside of New Zealand, you came to the UK. So I grew up in that town and. Uh, peaceful town back then you know we just surfed played on the beach enjoyed the sun um and then I, I followed my sister and many other of my friends you know after rugby we uh we joined the army what were you like at school like every uh new zealand boy back at school great at sport and uh mm. sort of had very little attention for for studying although um you know i did i i was quite quite good at art so i did a lot of artwork rugby's a big thing in new zealand eh? oh, rugby's huge Massive rugby, Australia, yeah. New Zealand, South Africa, yeah. three big, three of the big guns. Unbelievable. Were you a big rugby fan back then? Oh, still am now. Still am now. Rugby, rugby was huge. It's always a part of our game, uh, a part of our lifestyle. Rugby union or league? Rugby union. Rugby union. Um, it's it league wasn't as big. It was big, but it wasn't that known. But rugby union was always the, the number one sport. Uh, soccer or football was was sort of paid in, not well. Actually, encouraged at schools. Everyone played soccer before they played rugby because it made your, your hand-eye coordination a lot better, you know, kind of thing, and it made you a bit quicker, and then you went to rugby. If you stayed in soccer, it's because you went in and you got to rugby. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, no, we sort of played both, but we abandoned sort of soccer once we started playing rugby. How was family life, mum, dad? Typical New Zealand family life back then, you know, sort of like uh, we didn't have much. We lived in a council house. Um, everybody lived in the council house, but our house was – like every house on our street was immaculate. You know, the lawns were mowed, you knew all your neighbours, all the kids went out and played, told the bugger off when the sun come up, don't come back until the sun comes down. You, you hear it all the time. It was it was safe. Um, we we looked after ourselves. We had no we didn't hang around the house any chance we get to run uh, to run off. We did. We took it. Had all our cousins we played with. So it was it was really good. Um, you know, we 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 had. Well, I can sort of compare it to nowadays. I suppose we we knew the consequences to action, so we stayed out of trouble. We uh, we knew our responsibilities, and uh, we, you know we um, we was we were frightened of the policeman, so we didn't do anything that was going to get us in trouble. And uh, we respected our our parents, so it was great. Did the police have guns over there? Never, no, uh, no, they didn't have guns right until uh, well, even now, not all cops have guns. They carry them in the vehicles, but they still don't carry them openly very mm -hmm. much. What'd you do after school? After school, I used to do a lot of athletics. I used to love running, uh, ran around um, middle or long distance. Used to love it, running all the time. Joined Harriers, cross country running, um, and then uh, you know played rugby. Does, did you see it? Could you have had a career in rugby, or was that no, never no, happened? No, no, no. I was, I was okay. I was okay. I always made it to the second fifteens and the school first fifteens for a couple of games and all that, but I, I wasn't big enough. Even back then, you know, the guys were big. I mean, guys in our school, you know, we were maybe 15, 14, 15, you know, some of the guys playing in our first 15 rugby team, you know, <laughs> had to shave twice because they were that old, you know. Mm -hmm. They were they were getting quite up there, but they were all big, big, powerful guys. We had a lot of Polynesians and a lot of really big Marys. I feel as if that's all changed now. I feel as if the rugby players are becoming more athletic. They're not as fat and kind of bulky. No. Now they're just, you can play any height, any weight. They're real athletes now. I mean, you stand next to them now and, and we're dwarfs. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they're all, you know, a prop. Uh, you know, Case Muse, for example, when he was playing for the All Blacks, you know, he could do like a, a beep test we used to do in the unit. You know, the, the same amount of beeps as we could do. You know, huge guys, huge guys. And they're all in like six foot plus, super fast. Yeah, I mean, when it became professional, it finally became a serious game. Mm -hmm. You know, because back in our day, you know, watching the players, even if they wrote a book because it was a non-professional sport, they weren't allowed to play rugby. Mm -hmm. So making it professional really, really upped the uh, the school level and the athleticism of the players. Yeah, I loved watching Dan, Dan Carter back in the day. I used to watch all his documentaries just when his dad used to take him out in the backyard and yeah. just kicking, kicking, kicking. Yeah. Probably one of the greatest all times. I mean, probably Johnny Wilkinson. Yep. But unbelievable. Yeah. And I love the hack and that. They used to have to do that... For right from the start from a young age we learned it but we didn't have to do it 
why no no well i mean you're doing two new zealand teams against each other doing the hucker mm. you know it, you know it takes too much time we we all knew it and we loved it and i think you know the the, the hucker wasn't even taken that seriously in the all blacks um it was done and if you have a have a look at old you know all black footage and doing the hucker it, it's it's quite embarrassing you know um it wasn't really taken anywhere near to the degree of seriousness it is today and, and thanks all that's all thanks to buck shelford when he became the captain of the All Blacks, you know, fantastic number eight, um, he basically said, "Well, why are we doing this, this jig? Basically, let's do the, the hucker properly." Um, so he he was given permission to be able to do that, and now it's evolved into into what everybody basically loves to see first before every um, All Black game. The unfortunate thing I think for me is now every sports team in New Zealand does it. You know, we have female netball teams, we have male netball teams, our hockey teams, we have basketball teams. They all do a hucker first. It's kind of diluted it from the potency that it was when, when just the All Blacks did it. But now they do it with such passion. It, it's really, uh, it's it's really what everybody, it's not entertainment, but it's really gets you into the spirit of wanting to watch the game for sure. Yeah, that's when I used to watch, when I used to play Scotland or England, it was the hacker. Yeah. Because it was just magical. It was a crazy experience to think, what the fuck is happening? And it must put the fear into teams. I don't care how big you are, how strong you are, it must. Because the All Blacks were they were flying for many, many years. And yes. now it's kind of it's a level playing field, even with the teams here. Yeah. England, Scotland, Ireland, <clears throat> they're flying as well. But I seen a young girl in politics doing the hacker last year or a few months ago. Mm-hmm. Mad. What is, what is the meaning behind the hacker? Uh, there's several. There are several. It's a... Uh... It's a, it's a challenge for one. Um, you know, you're, you're about to go into battle, you know, and uh, you want to intimidate your opponent, and also you want to psych yourself up for the for the battle ahead. Um, it's respect, playing respect to the other team, believe it or not, uh, and respect to your elders and your ancestors and, and everything that makes you a New Zealander and a Maori. Um, and uh, it's to say, you know, we'll shake hands and have, have a beer afterwards, but right now we're going to do our best to kill you, you know. Because I seen who was the Irish player that kind of walked forward when I was doing the hacker, but the first five minutes they spiked him right into the ground, injured. Forget his name, yeah. but unbelievable, unbelievable player for Ireland as well. But I don't fuck about. Is that a sign of disrespect? If it is, yeah, and he walked right in front. I yeah. think when they were doing it, but yeah. the first five minutes into the game, they fucked him right into the grass. Yeah, yeah. And he was carted off, injured, missed the World Cup or something. Yeah, yeah. I forget his name. Surprised. So what happens then? When did you decide to join? Did you have to join what military first? Did you have to go army? Was it all the same as the basics here? Yeah. So there were two things in my life that sort of inspired me to want to join the SAS. And this was way before I even sort of really knew about them. Um, 69, I was, when I was a kid, I was watching the uh, the first Apollo 11 uh, moon capsule, mountains. moon landing. And, well, that was fine. That was cool. But it was when it came down and it landed in the water. You know, the capsule landed in the water and, and the frogmen jumped in from the helicopters, you know, the early, early Navy SEALs back in the day. And I, even as a kid, I remember going, you know, I want to do that. You know, I want to jump in the water and, you know, do, do cool stuff like that. And then second was, of course, uh, 1980, the uh, Princess Gate embassy siege with 2-2 SAS. And um, when, when the boys went in and rescued the hostages there, I, I thought, well, that's pretty cool. You know, I want to do that as well. Also, we also had a very... Um, formidable reputation as an SAS um, and where I come from in New Zealand it was kind of like a, a natural progression to to join the military and if you join the military you were going to go and try for the SAS we had a very big long history of of guys you know cousins and uncles who had made it into the SAS and in Vietnam they did very well uh, as an SAS and so we had a natural sort of uh, ability and and sort of karma with with the jungle and with the trees and with the forest because New Zealand's pretty pretty covered in the stuff and um, we were kind of we, we had natural ability to move around and, and sort of do things quite sort of quietly and what was expected of you and uh, our soldiering schools are always um, of a pretty high standard so it just became a sort of natural progression so I joined the army uh, primarily for that reason was to join the SAS eventually I didn't really know how I was going to do it um, and also as a means of leaving New Zealand because I couldn't afford to save up enough money and, and leave. So I was lucky enough when I joined that after uh, finishing my all my basic and, and core training and spending a little bit of time in infantry battalion, I, uh, I got a two-year posting to Singapore. We had a base over there at the time. So I 
really didn't do anything to help my SES progression from there because I was getting paid a ton of money and I was just drinking and having a good time like uh, squatties do. And, you know, it wasn't until my two years was coming up, I was going, well, what am I going to do? I might as well get serious about doing a selection. So I came back to New Zealand and um, I did the selection and I passed. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. And I was lucky enough that the uh, cycle that I was going to attend was going to happen straight after the selection. So I went back, packed my bags in the battalion. And if I hadn't passed, I was going to get out of the military. And then I went up and I um, dipped a pepper curry where the camp was and I started my cycle. Were you drinking heavily as a young kid also? I was drinking as we were drunken. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yes. You know, we one of the good things about the English and, and everything like that is when they came around and they conquered all these countries, they taught us how to drink. And it wasn't good drinking, it was binge drinking. You know, so we were, um, you know, Australia, Canada, in any of these Commonwealth countries, you know, when we, we don't hit it all the time, but when we do, we hit it hard. And in the military, you know, it's, it's you're, com- you're a big camaraderie, you're a big team and you, you celebrate everything, you know, and, and alcohol is a lot cheaper. So, of course, you know, we have a saying, you go ugly early. And uh, we used to do that. Yeah. What sort of training were you doing in the army? Was it, see, the basic training, was it difficult or was it just a free-for-all? No, we're very disciplined. Our basic training was fantastic. I mean, I've, I've probably never been as fit in my life uh, after my basic training. We were running around. Like all military um, training areas, it's the most inhospitable, horrible land you can think of. It's winter, summer, spring and autumn all in one day. Um, you know, our equipment was terrible, but we didn't know any better back then, so we just made it work. Um, we were fit. We had terrible food. You know, we shivered and we froze and, and we were hot. And um, But you just got on You just got on with it. You just got on and, and did it. And uh, it was it was fun. It was great. What age did you join SES Selection? 22. What was the training like at that at the start? Did you know what you were getting yourself involved with? Not at all. No, 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 not at all. In fact, you, you sort of take it one step at a time. You do the selection, and then from the selection, you're you're doing to your uh, your cycle. So each new each new subject is um, is all new. You have no idea really what's involved in it. Your your basic infantry training helps a lot for sure. I mean, because it's it's infantry kind of work to a degree, but each subject is so in depth that it takes months to learn that one particular subject and not even at a good standard. You learn the basics and you don't really apply, you don't really become very good at it until you've applied it over different missions or different years, you know. How long did it take to pass? So we have a different system from the UK. Our, um, our cycle is we do a pre-selection and then we do a two-week uh, selection course. So that means you're, you do lots of land navigation and that's just to weed out the people. You'll get 100 people maybe want to do a selection, and you know that the pass rate's probably going to be, you know, 3%, you know, maybe even less, you know, sometimes more. And you do a lot of land navigation, and the, and the way that you weed them out is that you're given a meal, and then you're told to go to checkpoint B, all right? So you go from A to B, you've got a certain amount of time to be there. If you don't make it in that time, that's been allotted, you owe time to get to C. So if you don't make it to C in time, checkpoint C, the time that you've missed adds up. Now, you can do all the checkpoints, but you may add, you may owe half an hour or an hour because you've lagged behind, you haven't kept the pace up. So you're basically running from one point to another in order to make it on time. It's not just a matter of being able to make it on time, you've got to make it at a certain time. And you won't get, you won't get another meal, basically, until you've made up the time. So that could possibly be the, the only meal you get during that whole cycle of that whole phase. Then you do um, other options or other... other um, Things like uh, 24, 12 to 24 hours in the sand dunes carrying jerry cans of water and then you uh, having to do navigation and 12 to 24 hours in swamps carrying uh, jerry cans of water. You walk 60 k's um, and you've got a certain amount of time to do it. Uh, there's you know swimming tests, there's initiative tests, there's teamwork tests and it's all that all takes about two weeks and then they say, okay, you know, you've passed or you've failed 
and then you're very happy. You think, you know, selection is the hardest thing you can do. It's not until you're actually in the SAS you find selection is probably one of the easiest things you you can ever do to get in there. And then you do your cycle, and that takes from anywhere from nine months to a year to do. What's the cycle? So the cycle is now all the different uh, subjects that you will need to learn in order to fit into a um, one of the squadrons. Back in my day, we had three squadrons. We had we had uh, sorry two squadrons, we, but we had black roll and green roll. So we had an A squadron and a B squadron because there wasn't very many of us. Uh, you did one year green roll, which meant that you spent your time in the jungle, in the bush, uh, doing your typical infantry uh, close protection. Uh, sorry, um, close reconnaissance training, and then you did one year in the black roll, and that was counterterrorism, uh, hostage rescue, um, marine counterterrorism, diving, and everything like that. So once you've done your cycle and your your selection and your cycle, that's almost a year. Then you'll go into your squadron, and let's say your squadron's doing one year of green roll. So that's another year. Then you'll then change over to black roll. So really, you're not you're not really past the selection until you've done three years. What they're looking for your strength and your weaknesses. Determination, teamwork. Um, it's not about you know. You may hear stories about oh, an SES guy can you know because he's such individuals and all that. Yeah, sure. But we work as we work as a team. That's the best way you're going to get your results. Um, never never knowing when to quit. Always getting up. Uh, finding. If solution A doesn't work, then you find solution B. Um, uh, just sort of, you know, going beyond what you think you're capable of going beyond. And that's all in your head. It's not your body. It's, it's See that feeling there? See what you say about never quitting? Is that something you're born with or can you be conditioned to think that way? I like to say, now I think you're born with it. I think you're born with it. You know, some guys perhaps could be conditioned with it. You know, you knock them down, they'll get up again, then you knock them down. But it's, I think the guy who, who gets knocked down and he just keeps getting up and he, he uses the, the anger of him getting up to keep him going forward. It's, it's, that's go, that's got to be burning him already, I think. Because mm -hmm. I've interviewed a lot of SCS, SBS, and just built different. Some of them, are, they're just, they're, there's something not quite right here. There's, oh, there's no. something missing. Yes. You know, so... But what do you think the main ingredient is to then pass SAS selection? Determination. You, you've got to have a mantra as well. You've got to have a reason for wanting to do it. My mantra was, you know, what sounds better to my sisters than my brother tried for the SAS selection when my brother is in the SAS? And to me, I just kept saying it over and over in my head. And it always came down to me. My sisters will think, what sounds better is my brother is in the SAS. And also, you've got to live with yourself. You know, you don't try it. To fail it, you trial it to pass it, and if you didn't pass it, like I did my very first selection in Singapore, I, I tried twice, and I failed. And even though I wasn't really that sort of serious about it, because um, I just gave it a go, I did start getting this feeling. Well, well, you know, I failed, so I failed myself, and I know I can do better than this. So when I did it again in New Zealand, it was solely with the with the intention of of passing. What made you push through the second time? What was the difference? Uh. You only get you only get two ch two chances to try. Um, sometimes you get three, but very very often, you know. Um, the trying it in in Singapore, you, you, we did it all in Malaysia, and that was through jungle training. Now, as much as I enjoyed my my time in Singapore, I was in the infantry battalion. Infantry battalion back then, this is you know you got to remember the day before GPSs. Um, we weren't taught to navigate anywhere near as precisely as you are as in the SAS. So you get a you get an infantry soldier who follows, you give him a map and a compass and you say, now off you go, yeah, we're gonna get lost. And and we always always did because we weren't trained to, to navigate in such close environments and in the jungle, we just sort of followed. Um when you go to New Zealand, it's more open country, it's uh different varieties, uh you're you're you know what's more expected of you because failing the first one is actually good practice for the second one. So you brush up on your navigation, you become more skilled at it, so you, you're not going in totally blind like I did for my very first one. What's the worst thing about SES selection? Failing. That can be, that's the worst thing. And, uh, and I've met lots of guys who've always given the old, oh, yeah, I would have I would have passed if it wasn't for my, my knee or for this or for that. At the end of the day, you failed, you know, and you've got to live with that. Do you see guys who are broken who still push through and pass? Oh, for sure. In New Zealand, and, and 
you see guys, you, their fittest, their, their toenails, are, my toenails fell off, they all, your toenails are falling off, your, your skin's falling off your feet, yet they're limping, they're broken, and they just do not give up. And, and I, I, 1994, I had the pleasure of coming over here to uh, the UK, and uh, I was a um, directing staff on the first SAS, SBS joint selection. And uh, I was just totally unfamiliar with, with how the uh, 2-2 did their selection. And uh, they had some guys from the Paris trying for it. And my God, these guys were busted before they even started the selection because the Paris didn't want them to join the SAS because they were losing good soldiers. So they beasted them, you know, out on their trainings. And these guys just would not stop, you know, and you can't make them stop unless, you know, and they were getting medically checked every day and the doc was saying, you know, you, you should be pulling off for these guys. They just wouldn't see it. They wouldn't have it. They just carried on, carried on, and they passed. The mind's a powerful tool. Uh. Unbelievable. That's the, that's the key ingredient for anything totally. you want to do in life is the mindset. That's right. No matter how big you are, strong you are, that's, that's irrelevant when it comes to the, the mind. And you've probably seen it. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. With SCX selection, it doesn't mean fuck all having muscles. No, a lot no. of the Scottish pass SCX selection. A lot of the Scottish too. Yeah. You've fucking wired up wrong. Yeah, but I think a lot of people. Who's come, I don't know if that comes from old DNA. I don't know if that comes from certainly does ancestors or whatever it is, where it's ingrained in you through that fighting spirit. Mm -hmm. Same as the Irish and the kind of tapped. Yeah, not quite right. No, nah, you, you got to be a little bit sort of. Yeah, you got to be a little bit mental to to, to be in the unit as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's no sane person would want to put themselves through that sort of carry on. You know, and there is that. Whatever, whatever it is, and whatever your background is, that, and I believe it's DNA as well. You know, you've you've got to be something. There's got to be a wire somewhere, but you've got to be, you've got to have that a little bit of mongrel in you. You mm -hmm. know, you've got a bit of mongrel in you. You'll be all right. Yeah, especially in this day and age, man. It's everything soft. Right. So, what happens when you pass selection? Then, what did you feel as if you were accomplishing stuff? Did you feel as if okay, life is going to get better? Not realizing the extent of it's crazy in that industry, but did you feel? Good. I was always something missing. You always chasing something. Now, now, once you pass the selection, and you're in the next achievement, you 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 know you keep going, and it's not until you you're handed and you're presented with your beret and your belt, okay, and you put the sand beret on for the first time. That's a huge, huge um, sense of achievement. You know, you're now in a fraternity that's that only a few people, only a few, whatever. Not many people have the you know have ever had the privilege of being in. But then you know. You take it off and you get on with the job, you know, and it's a huge achievement and it's always a learning experience. You, the only time you sort of think, okay, you know, I'm getting a bit tired of this is when, um, okay, you're missing too many awards because of your, the country's, you know, political sort of leanings and, or your geography as in New Zealand or your body's starting to break down. But you can, you can stay in there for, for a very long time and there's always that sense of achievement. And um, when you sort of lose that spark, that's when it is time to think about maybe it's time to look at doing something else. What was your first mission? Um, we 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 didn't really have a lot of missions back in our day because hey, a lot of things it was the eighties and the nineties. So we were almost like a peacetime army, mm -hmm. you know. But um, and now the last the only sort of mission our guys had was uh, former Vietnam guys who were our instructors, and we were we were envious of them. Um, in the eighties we had nothing, and in the nineties we we didn't really have anything. Of course, Fiji used to kick off all the time, so we'd be over in the Pacific Islands all the time. Uh, Solomon's they were they were, you know, kicking off as well. They weren't very happy with what was going on over there. Um, Bosnia was uh, that happened as well, but then only a certain amount of people went there, and I wasn't I wasn't one of them. So I didn't have any live combat missions in my time in the SAS. I basically went through the whole peacetime army, like sort of many many of the guys around my around my era, and it wasn't until um, Afghanistan, when I was already out, that uh, the guys actually got some good operational experience. So, you, how was that feeling? Were you wanting chaos? Were you wanting war? Were you wanting of shootings? Course. Were you wanting the, the badness of it? <clears throat> yes, yes, of course. It's because that's what you say not for it. It's that, yeah. isn't it? Anybody that says definitely is fucking lying. That's why your driver's license you're not allowed to drive. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course you do. You know, and uh, like I say in, in the in the book, and, and like I tell people who who sort of oh well, you you were in the peacetime army. It was was it wasn't my choice. You know, I'm not a I'm not a politician who decides when and where to use the unit. And, and of course, our 
our neck of the woods, there wasn't always a great deal going on, but we had to stay down there because we were the ones looking after that, that uh, the Southern Hemisphere, mm-hmm. you know, us and the Australians. The Australians were somewhat luckier than we were because they played with the uh, Americans. So we, we didn't. We were anti-American at the time uh, with the nuclear policy we had in New Zealand. Um, but, you know, we were with the Brits, and the Brits weren't really going anywhere, even the Falklands, you know, that sort of finished too, too soon for us. So how long did you stay in the SAS? I stayed in the SAS for seven years, uh, in the military in total, for 10 years. Mm-hmm. So when did you end up involved in Iraq? So when I got out, you know, it was the... It was a normal story, you know, what the hell am I going to do now? I've got all this training, um, what am I going to do? I've got a family, uh, so there is nothing for me to do. I can't work in New Zealand, standing at a door doing security, you know, sort of, hey, it's embarrassing, um, and you don't get paid anywhere near as enough, anywhere enough that you think that you're worth, and that's what the SES does give you, it gives you value, you know, you, you, you know you're worth a lot more than, say, someone who wasn't in. So you, you kind of expect that that's the kind of pay you're going to. And I was very lucky. I had a, a friend at the time um, back then uh, working in, who worked uh, for the Royal Family of Brunei. So he went to Brunei and he got me over. And in 96, we were, we were in Brunei and uh, training hand-to-hand combat for the uh, Sultan of Brunei and his brother, Prince Jeffrey, his... Um, his uh, security, plus doing a whole heap of other types of work, and we had a great time. I got over a lot of other former SES players of mine, so our rugby team was was very good. Um, we played against the uh, the UK had a training uh, training base out there. We played against them all the time, and uh, you know, I moved more into close protection from there, which is my logical progression of what am I going to do. So I became a bodyguard and uh, I got into the close protection industry. What was that like? You know, it's it's a natural step. It's 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 it was easy. It was easy for me. It's kind of right up my alley. Yeah, you can work. One thing also about the unit is yes, you can work very well on your own. You can work in a team. So I worked. I was on my own. I was, uh, you know, starting to generate my now quite famous sort of like disdain for people. You know, sort of like just leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. It's a very lone wolf kind of job um, when you're by yourself. You do the job and you're sort of grey man. You, you're behind the scenes, but you make yourself and you make your presence known when you feel that you need to. You know, you're not one of these. You're not one of these celebrity bodyguards. You know, you're not there out in front creating um, publicity or creating a scene so the media will see you because that's how they have to. They have to operate that way. So because the artist, the entertainer, wants the people to see them. That's how they sell their merchandise. Business people don't work like that. They don't want to be seen. They want to be in the background. They want to get from A to B totally un, you know, just leave them alone. So you're, you're smooth, you know. More money, close protection. Yeah, much more money. Much Safer more money. or more, more life-threatening? Depends on how you do it and who your client is. Because a lot of people I know have been killed in that industry as well. Yeah, it depends on uh, who, who your client is. And... Uh, you know, where you go, where you go. It's um, sometimes working by yourself is, you know, advantageous because it's an easier to just blend in two people and then sometimes it's not so much because you're only one person. In a lot of countries that you go to, you can't carry a firearm. There's no such thing as an international firearms license. So I can't pack a gun with me, so I've got to improvise with whatever I can uh, when I get there. And if we don't have um, security support, you know, you kind of on your own. So you you, you improvise and um, you just keep yourself sharp and you... Do you feel better without a weapon? Or are you still trained to then... No, no, still trained to use one. I'd love to have one sometimes and I've been better off without them because the, the less competent people within our industry will rely on that weapon, you know. They will think that that's the first thing that they will go to if something bad happens. The whole thing about close protection is threat avoidance. It's about reading the situation. So if I see something's happening, okay, and I can predict what's going to be happening by just reading what's the tension in the room or what's going on, I do a lot of homework, I'll get my client out of there. We won't even go there, you know. Where if I've been in a, you know, a venue with my client and something kicks off and I haven't seen it, then I haven't done my job right, you know. And... It's not about getting into a punch-up or a shootout. It's about getting my client out and away, 
if I've got that close to somebody that I have to either punch them or shoot them, then I've messed up somewhere down the line. Yeah, if you're somebody's bodyguard, what's the first thing you look for when you enter a room? Where the buffet is. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> uh, I stand back. I read the room. I have a look at the faces and the hands of everybody. I read hands and faces. I see where I'm going to position myself. I see where he's going to be, who's around him. I, I'm always not not that far away from where he is and I try and blend in so people don't see me so if my client comes in they don't say oh he's got a security guy with him you know I'll try and step back a little bit so they won't pay me any attention because my client is well known I'm not they will look at him I'll, I'll blend in if I walk in and I'm like I'm the bodyguard you know, I've already blown my own cover mm -hmm. so that's just made my job harder and anyone trying to perhaps do anything against my client now, is, now knows that they also have to take care of me as well so if I'm more of the grey man lurking in, in, in around, and they haven't seen that, then I'm I'm in a better position to do something without being noticed. Why the hands? Hands, you know, it's pretty hard to carry, uh, to hit somebody, shoot somebody, or throw something if, uh, you know, the hands are empty. Um, also, people tend to show their tension with hands, and, you know, they'll ring them, or they'll hold them with their fingers interlocked, or they'll do whatever. Um, faces you can, you can cover. I mean... Faces, they say, well, you look at people's faces and their eyes. No, no, people are pretty good at their faces as a decoy, you know, not looking like they want to do something. But the hands are a little bit different. If you wanted to punch or kick or shoot or whatever, you've got to reach in and hold it in your hand physically. You know, so when I see that, you know, that's what I'm looking for, is to see if there's anything in the hands that can be used uh, as, a, as a weapon of some kind. Do you get taught that body language movement? Yeah. Well, not really, no. It's, it's just one of the skills that you sort of, you think that you might need. So you, you, you do it yourself. Um, you know, I, I became a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor with, within the SAS, all right? And so we had a fantastic uh, master instructor by the name of Jeff Todd. And his style of system was basically street fighting because that's how it's going to be. But it was tailored toward the military because... If we're doing an operation out and, and you know we're carrying packs on our backs and we have to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat, for example, our energy levels are going to be very, very low. So we, we don't have the stamina or the cardio to, to fight because we're just not eating enough and our body's eating itself in order to stay out there. So our basic you know, target areas are eyes, throat, and knees. You know? uh, there's no muscles over any of those groups, so it doesn't matter you know, how big you are. You know, like a guy your size or something, there's no point in me trying to you know, knock you over with a punch to the gut because it's not going to work or, or to, the, to, the, to the chest, you know, because you build up in those areas, you know, a strong guy, but there's no, any, any exercises you can do to build up muscles around your eyes. You know, you take out the eyes, there's the vision, instant pain, okay, takes their mind off wanting to fight. Take out the throat, okay, you've collapsed their ability to breathe, so they don't want to fight. You take out their knees, there's no muscles over those areas either. So there's no foundation, they fall to the ground, can't get up again. So that's the three targets, the eyes, the throat, the knees. Eyes, throat, and knees. What's the first thing people do when they get punched, do you think? What's the first? A lot of people kill it away, 99.9% of people are asking. Because I, I read something that men actually think they can fight 4,000 times more than what they actually can. Oh, yeah. But majority of men can't fight. You know yourself, having a square goal, which we call it here, or a fight, the average man will, will blow a gasket after 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's also due to lack of adrenaline control, you know, because adrenaline kicks in. It's a nasty little drug within your body that it makes it, um, and I sort of mentioned it in my book too, like when I, when I do, you know, get into a shootout, you got to control that, you know, and your, your knee starts to wobble and your hand starts to, you know, your, mm -hmm. your, your vision starts to close down. It's adrenaline, and what it's doing is it's preparing you for a fight. And also it makes you a, a stronger target. So you can take a bit more of a beating, then what you wouldn't, you know, that you'd be able to take, let's say if your adrenaline wasn't flowing, and it'll make you react a lot better. It's, it also kicks in your fight or flight reaction. When some people will fight, some people will run away. That's, that's again, again, what adrenaline will do. And, and people who blow their gasket, they're, they're not controlling it, and their hands will shake, their knees will shake, their, their, their breathing becomes really rapid and fast, but they're burning their energy. It's like they're on turbocharge, and all of a sudden, you know, their tank's going to be empty. Yeah, cause I had a boxing match like two years ago. Trained hard, couldn't have trained. I probably could have trained a little harder, but I felt as if I was prepared. But after the second round, I was fucking gone. Yeah, I still won, but I was 
I was gone. I just no air in there. I just felt as if everything was loose and I'm wobbling. And uh, just adrenaline, nerves, and fear. Yeah, I was scared. Listen, I was scared, but it's just that to overcome that fear is it, 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 such a beautiful feeling. Hmm. But I was fucking, I was, oh, everything went. I was main event, so I was waiting around six, seven hours. And by that time, I was dancing, getting into the ring, and I, my coach was thinking, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, by the yeah, time yeah. It, the bell went, man, I was tired. Yeah, yeah. Is that, how do you control that? Is that breathing? Or is that, breathing. Just used, or is that just overcoming the fears every time? Reprogramming the brain? What is the main? Breathing and repetition, really. Is that? Breathing and repetition. you got to be able to breathe. You know, And breathing, you know, you're going back to the rugby, for example, um, you know, we never did Pilates stretching or anything like that. Stretching was for pussies, yeah. you know, which is why I have a bit of trouble sort of doing my laces up nowadays and I, I, I put the whole the ball in the golf you know the golf ball in the hole but i have a bit of trouble reaching down <laughs> far enough to pull it out again uh -huh. you know you know rugby players now they learn to breathe you know my wife was the pilates instructor for the all blacks mm -hmm. and um apart from seeing harry nutsacks all day she was you know she was saying that you know just over time they got better and better and it was all through breathing learning how to breathe and it's not like just in and out it's taking it all in and all that you do that with adrenaline, and and I'm sure when you were fighting, it was all short, quick breaths. You mm. know, it was like, you know, and um, that's what exhausts you a lot quicker as well. And repetition. You know, the more you do it, the more comfortable you become with it, and and the whole atmosphere of the event and everyone cheering and everyone screaming doesn't get to you so much. You can focus a lot more. So I, you know, that's all part of it too. So when we used to train for like for hostage rescue and, and whatever else, and we used to use live people for hostages and stuff. Yeah, we'd be flying in on a helicopter and, and standing on the skids and your, your legs are shaking because you're all ramped up to get in there. And after years of doing it, it's just like, okay, we know, well, when can we get to the bar for a, for a beer once we finish this, you know? When do you become cold to the world then? Do you totally shut off every feeling and emotion that you were born with? Or do you still feel? Yeah, you, you know, yeah. There's a different types, I, I think, for me personally, where you become sort of cold to the world to a degree. Um, mine, was, mine was in Iraq. Um, and you see, you see the bullshit that's been sold that causes problem, you know. And then, and I think you'll you'll find that if a lot of lot of ex-military type of people uh, is that yeah, we're all keen as mustard to get over there. And we we want to test our skills and everything like that. But when you get over there and you see, man, we've been we've been told a crock of shit, you know. This isn't uh, this isn't how it's sold. And the people back in New Zealand or the UK and what their media. Uh, you know who are in on it um are selling to the people it's not quite right you know and you become very um disillusioned you yeah. know i don't trust the media i don't trust governments i, I don't trust anyone who says that they're uh, an expert on something an expert it means you've maybe just read a couple more books on it anything can be skewed to be you know the right way of looking at it depends on how you want to do it and um so i, I go through that every day you know, I read the news and I'm very sort of, yeah, I mean, every time there's a war or a conflict, you know, what, what bullshit's been sold and what's it really like on the ground? Yeah, yeah. it's who's making the most money. Oh, oh, this is a power trip. But again, yes. human beings, as much as we can be strong and try to be independent and see the world differently, we're easily manipulated, we are easily controlled, we are easily programmed because people, that was your only main source, was TV, newspapers, so when you're hearing about weapons of mass destruction, Saddam Hussein's an evil man, people are willing to die for their country because they think what they're doing is right. Mm -hmm. you're, you're signed up to take orders. That's, that's part of your job. I've had the SAS who loved that, who mm -hmm. loved being taught to, to take orders and shoot people, blow people up. That was their job. They loved it. They didn't know. None the wiser. So I have no problems or issues with anybody on this planet because it's all they knew then. It's once you start stepping outside the box and interviewing the people I've interviewed, you think, wow, no weapons of mass destruction, over a million Iraqis died. Yes. For what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For who? Yeah. For Halle Burton, for KBR, for Dick Cheney, for oil rights, for, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's the saying, where'd you go? How did all that American oil get under this Iraqi sand? You know, for nothing. You know, for nothing. And for the industrial, you know, military industrial complex. You know, I mean, uh, look at... Um, Look at Israel and Gaza now. Who's benefiting from that? You know, the people who make weapons. Who's who's benefiting from Ukraine and, and Russia? The people who make weapons. They're making billions of dollars hand over fist. They don't want it to stop. Money is the root of all evil. Completely. 
completely. It's sad though, isn't it? That, yeah. Because it's the same patterns. Wars have always been here from, I don't know how long human beings have, are here. You can read books and say humans have been here for billions of years, millions of years. I genuinely don't know, but if, if the history books are true, which obviously some of them will be de debunked as being full of shit, but then nothing's really changed. Everything's war, everything's greed, everything's pain, everything's plagues and mm -hmm. sickness. And that's how the world is controlled. Yeah, I was asked once, you know, sort of, you know, do you think humans will ever stop, you know, warring each other, fighting each other? And I said, no, it's impossible. I believe it's in our DNA. We have to conquer each other. We have to take, you have something that I want. And I, you know, it's not because I really need it. It's just that I want it. And as long as we've got that in our DNA, we're never going to stop. And I think that's, that's a way of, making sure that we rid ourselves of ourselves and so the next lot of ourselves can start again and 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 re, re you know restart the cycle you yeah. know as a sickness totally uh, to be the best to work like even podcasts no matter what it is yeah. you want to be the best you want to be the the, the big man you want to be the number yeah. one but some people take it to an extreme yes. a lot of these people in power you've got black rock you've got all the governments it's the people behind them who are funding it it's the people who are sitting in a fancy office or sitting in a big castle just calling the shots and they've got so much money. Money's no object for them. It's not nothing, no yeah. feeling for it anymore. Destruction is. Yes. You can go down the route of 9-11, you can go down the route of Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia. It's just, people think you're a conspiracy theorist, but how fucked up can you be to not see that the patterns are there? Mm-hmm. Who's calling the shots? Why is our young kids going and dying? For yeah. who? Mm -hmm. For what? Obviously, yeah. because like you say, you want away. You want to travel the world. You want to see new things. Same as a lot of people who are in the SAS here. A lot of them come from broken homes, abused, yeah. bullied when they're younger. They want away from that mum or dad or uncle who's abused them. So they want to give everything to feel a part of a brotherhood. Yes. But then once you start questioning that, you start thinking, fuck me, how much was I? Was I just getting used? Yeah. Did you, did you start feeling that, that you were becoming a pawn in the game? Uh, not well not in the military no i wasn't we we no no i wasn't then it was only only really when i was i started getting into combat military the military close protection you know but uh then you know and mainly in iraq because i was lucky enough where i i was doing a lot of more individual by myself i'd be a, a you wanted me you hired me as an individual and i'd work with a team and when the mission was over i'd go back to you know doing whatever the hell i was doing the only time I was in a formally structured big company was was Blackwater, and I was the I was the C one, so I was kind of in charge. And you do see it for sure, particularly. I mean, that was a classic example of exactly everything we've just said. Like, when is enough enough? This whole war was started for 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 greed, you know, and the war criminals that started and continued it, and, you know, never faced any ramifications. Yeah, I tried to join the Marines when I was 18. Yeah. Thank fuck I didn't get in. I was supposed to go and do it. They'd done a written exam, then you had to go and do like a six week thing. I think it was Catholic in England. I'm not sure, but I ended up not going because I love to drink and take drugs back then. Yeah, yeah. I'm fucking glad I didn't go because I don't know where my mind would be. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I loved, I wanted to escape yeah. because I seen a few boys who were doing the Marines and, and they just looked strong, they looked fit, they looked fresh, they just they, they had a presence. Yes. And I thought, I'm kind of slipping in life. I yeah. felt it was if I needed some guidance, yes. some discipline. Yes. And I think every kid should have that between 15, 16, 17, when they've got some discipline and getting up early and making their own bed and keeping fit. I think a lot of things are coming soft. Whether it's for the military, listen, I don't really agree with it. I think all wars murder now, but I never used to think that way either. Like mm -hmm. I say, I was all four. I used to remember as a kid, I used to play with little tanks and soldiers. Mm -hmm. And it was in. But again, is that just programming you to then want to fight, want to shoot, little tanks blowing each other up, watching all the army movies as well, and it just looked amazing. Yeah, I, I to a degree, I believe it is. But, you know, I mean, Eden is, I'm pretty sure I wasn't around, of course, but, I mean, if you got back into the caveman type days, you know, male kids did that. You know, we we, we fought each other, you know, mm. they made sticks and we started to smack each other. Um, and, it, it, and it evolved. And where I think it's gone totally askew now is, and I'm having this sort of battle with... Um, some of the things I'm, I'm 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 posting on is I believe New Zealand's lost its way something terrible, 
and the youth of today, the youth crime and the youth violence in New Zealand is completely out of hand. So I'm advocating for, you know, military style, compulsory military style boot camps. You know, it doesn't have to involve weapons or hand to hand combat or anything sort of like that. But you, there are so many broken families in New Zealand now. There are so many broken homes, so many single mothers and, and, and pathetic wasted fathers and everything like this. And it's not just pathetic, you know, okay, mothers are, are just as bad, I suppose. Um, and, and the children don't have any things you mentioned. They don't get up early. You know, they get up, they do this. You know, parents don't care because this is now the new babysitter. They don't have to look after their kids anymore. And they don't have any structure. They don't have any discipline. They have no uh, role models. They have no mentors. So what are they meant to do? What they see on TV, you know? Oh, okay, car chases and, and shootouts. What they're playing on the video games. And what a lot of people don't realize, well, sorry, what a lot of people do realize, but more people like we're talking about have the money to, to squash their opinions, is that the video games that they're playing are actually originated to make killing in the military easier. So a kid playing Grand Theft Auto now is actually playing a game that was designed to desensitize someone to be able to kill somebody. And there's there's a great there's two great books by um, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. One's called On Combat, and one's called On Killing. On Killing, I read it years and years ago, and I agree with everything that it says. What it goes into is how back in the day, Napoleon's time, when they first started doing these surveys, as to why they were shooting so many bullets but hitting hardly anybody. And what was happening was that people weren't naturally wanting to kill every you know kill each other. They had to be trained and taught to do that and you can shoot a thousand bullets but if you're only hitting a hundred people that's super expensive because all those bullets cost money and to make and all that sort of carry on so they thought well how the hell are we going to improve on this and so they started adding a value system to your targets and it became quite sophisticated in the vietnam war and how you did that was you desensitized your targets it became a dinga zip ahead and a chink in the wire and all this sort of carry on and by killing somebody you are, you were rewarded and then your endorphins started to kick in. And you thought, well, okay, well, this is cool. This is So you'd go out and, and people became totally desensitized to killing people. And now it's a game. It's video games. They make billions of dollars by, watch, by desensitizing children to play the games that were designed for military people to kill without costing a shit ton of money. It's the same as porn as well. Yeah. How much that fucking fries the banana like? <clears throat> yeah, for sure. How it, that changes the mindset, how we see things as objects, how it's not really living, but again, we become some feeling goes away, what yeah. darkens the amygdala, what makes you depressed, and <clears throat> we're seeing when there's no love, there's no compassion. I think human beings on a whole are good people, genuinely good people. We want to see good. If we see someone getting harmed, if we see a dog getting harmed, I would probably kill someone quicker if I seen a dog getting harmed than a fucking human. Yeah, me the too. way I'm on life the now, but. <clears throat> I just feel as if when we see things getting harmed, our natural instincts is to go and help. For me anyway, but I just feel as if, like you say, people can be programmed the first seven years of your life. The same as people who are watching Disney films. There's a lot of death, there's a lot of misery, there's a lot of gangs, there's a lot of raised with step-parents, bad aunties and bad uncles. I've never, no Disney film has ever been raised in a stable household. Yeah. Ever. It's all broken homes, it's all violence, it's all rage, it's all trying to escape, it's all it's all manipulation. And I think before the ages of five or six, they've seen thousands and thousands of murders. Now, why is cartoons showing murders? Why are they showing killings? I don't need to show that to mm -hmm. kids. But again, it's to desensitise and feel as if and normalise. Yes. Same as all the paedophilia shit and all these drag queens and all this. Uh, you've got um, or transgenders and all that's normalizing madness it's normalizing our mental health it's normalizing all the bullshit that we shouldn't really be talking about but you speak about it enough it starts leaving fucking imprints in your brain it also helps distract it helps distract so those with nefarious intentions i.e politicians or whoever else can do what they want to do because everybody's too busy focused on something else that's not as important mm -hmm. you know but then i mean and the importance of this will come in because now that's all you're thinking about and it's these just stop oil idiots, you know, who happen to be wearing everything they wear. Like one one of the guys said to them, "Is everything you're wearing is made of oil?" You know, it's, you're being financed by an American whose interest is in in oil firms. You idiots, you know, it's the it's the whole climate thing. It's the whole they're, they're major distractions as well, because if people are distracted looking one way, the government's got free hand to go and do whatever they want to do in another way. You know, so and and those who 
I'm distracted. You know, generally get called the conspiracy theorist or whatever else. You know, because you know, a conspiracy theory normally comes along with some some backbone of truth. There's only a very small percentage of these people who call the shots who run the media yeah. to make these big changes. And if yeah. that shows you how dumbed down people are, you look at lockdown. Yeah. The whole oh world God. went into lockdown. Yeah. The whole fucking world went into lockdown. And I understand and always say this, the world is controlled by fear. Yeah. People were scared. So I've not problems with people doing what they're doing, getting jabs and getting mm -hmm. boosters. Listen, by all means, you do you. I was still climbing my mountains. I was still doing my cold water therapy. Because I felt my mental health slipping because I seen what was happening. Why is something a 99.9% .9 survival rate but yet it shut down the world? More yeah. people are dying with suicide, addiction, heart disease. We've got foods in every shopping centre that's fucking added with chemicals and sprayed with so much shit. Yeah. Nobody says anything. Everything's mm -hmm. processed. We've got breads and butters that are apparently causing Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's wasn't even here in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. And now it's one of the most leading causes of death. Mm -hmm. Something's not right. It's certainly not changing the climate because that's yeah. all bullshit. Check the foods. Check the fucking foods. And the, if you actually look to see what's in these foods. And I, listen, as much as I know this, I still struggle because I'll still go and eat shit. Yeah, I mean, but look, so I mean, when, when I was a kid, the only allergies anybody ever had was the occasional asthmatic. Someone, you know, you never heard of anybody who was allergic to fish, allergic to peanuts. We ate everything that was put in front of us. I mean, there may have been some kids who were allergic to this shit, yeah. but they weren't as common as like now. You know, everyone's allergic to, well, kids are allergic to all sorts of crap. And then you have a look at, uh, you know, the, the grain of wheat, for example. You know, when you see that from what it looked like back in the 50s to what it looks like now. I mean, it's quadrupled in size because mm -hmm. they they got to fuck with everything. You know, and it's all part of... It's all part of like the the Rupert Murdochs and the whoever else and the Black Rocks and everything, as we mentioned. You know, how much money is enough? And it's all about influence. And you give someone enough money, I think, and, you know, it, it'll eventually turn into evil intentions just yeah. to see how much they can get away with. Because I read a book called Wheat Belly. Very yeah. powerful books about how the wheat and the, it's all how it's connected to Alzheimer's and. Yeah. Memory loss and it's fucking scary. That oh, yeah. is scary how yeah. evil the world can be with the higher powers to then control and to then suppress and for people not to think outside the box. If you think outside the box and start growing an audience, you will be cancelled. You do become a target. You will be sent to prison. If you still become a pain in the ass, they will just kill you off. Yeah, and don't you think that was part of I, you know, what the whole lockdown was all about? Let's see how what we can get away with. And they got away with anything. And they everything. got away with it all. Yeah. The amount of people that, you know, that, that followed it, you know, and, and if you said anything against it, you know, you were mocked, you were locked up, you were exactly everything you just said. Ridicule, laughed at, everything. Yeah, exactly. It scares me, though. It does scare me, especially as a father. And wow. I always try and figure it out. But when you're going up against such powerful forces, what good are we? Yeah. What, do you know what I'm saying? You do question it. They just sit back and fucking live your own life move into the woods and grow your own fruit and veg. A lot of people, if all supermarkets closed, majority would die with starvation. Yeah. Nope, they don't know how to grow their own fruit and veg. No, no, no. That's it's fucking crazy. Yeah. It's so basic as well for seeds and soil to then grow your own stuff. It's, it's, the seeds and the, the fruits can grow your own fruits and veg and whatever it is you've got. Like People are so dumbed down and I feel as if that is when you question the schooling system. Kids should, kids should be getting taught this stuff at school. But yeah. they don't. You're dumbed down, sit at a desk, use your, your left side of your brain, which is your memorization. They don't want any individuality. They don't want any creativity. And again, it is scary times. And you sit back and I do question myself as well because I don't always get it right. I'm not as educated as I'd like to think I am. But I interview enough people to understand the moves that are happening. Yeah, no, and, I, and, and people should be questioning. They should be questioning, you know, people like us who question it, because if everyone complied, they'd have whatever they wanted quicker. So you have to question everything, and you have to, you know, you have to not not be afraid to put your head above the parapet every so often, you know, and you're going to get, like I get it, like with this, this this whole LinkedIn sort of like posting I've got myself into. I'm now my father who used to yell at the TV at the news. My yelling at the TV is my, my posting, and sometimes I do it because I'm genuinely concerned and I want to raise um, you know, I want to raise some questions and sometimes I'll do it just to, you know, cause I'm stirring shit, mm. you know, I just want to see what sort of reaction I'm going to get. And you have to question and otherwise, you know, you, you're, you're hastening 
the demise of the human species and the, and the human race, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and this is coming from someone who does, who has done what you've just mentioned. I live out in the country, up in the hills, away from people because, um, you know, that's the kind of lifestyle I prefer. I find being around people for too long is, is, is horrible for me, you know? I have certain triggers that, that set me off and I'd sooner just, my, my easiest way is just to sort of get away from them. Um, but you still have to question and you still have to sort of try and bring back some of the things that we can see that are missing. And I think, you know, my, my age, you know, uh, and our generation is we were very lucky because we weren't raised on internet, Wi-Fi and, and oh. smartphones and all this. So we had to use our brains and everything else like that. You imagine during lockdown, what would have killed most of the people if the Wi-Fi and the whole world had switched off? There'd be people jumping off the roofs, you know, kids, because mm -hmm. they can't live without it. We never had it, so we didn't know any better. So we can live without it. And yeah. it's only going to get worse. My grandchildren are going to have a hell of a time. You know, you take my granddaughter's phone off and she just, she's ready to kill. The brain is the mindset, it's the attention span, it's the curving of the spine, it's the fingers. I've, I've got it in here as well, with holding my phone, the dent yeah. and yes. the finger. Yeah. But again, I'm still addicted, I'm part of the system. Yes. So I contradict myself a lot. Yeah. And I understand mm -hmm. it as well. But I think within the next three to five years, I think I will disappear and mm -hmm. live a life in nature and I think fuck this who am I fighting against yeah do you know what I'm saying because it becomes tiresome were you always a bit of a loner Baz before SAS or did that happen when you you started seeing the world for what it is no I was always I, I was always a bit of a loner um I mean I had four sisters for Christ's sake so getting their hand-me-downs for school was always really depressing you <laughs> know sort of like um no, I, I I did have that sort of bit of a loner. Uh, I can always could always count my friends on one hand. You know, I always put you know friends before the insecure. Um, yeah, but and even now I've got four or five, maybe even less close friends, and that's the way I like it. Mm -hmm. um, I have no trouble being on my own. You know, I could be locked up, and you know, I'd be quite happy. Yeah, you know, but uh, I don't need that social interaction all the time. I, I do with my wife. She understands me, and um, you know, we don't talk to each other all the time. We'll have periods, you know, we'll maybe just say hi, how you going, and chat for maybe a total of two hours in a whole day, and that's plenty. That's all I need. That's all she needs. So I'm like that now. As, as I'm getting older, I just, I just don't like being around people. My yeah. job is to talk. I fucking love conversations, but <clears throat> I just love my dogs. I love my my family. Even they become fucking pests. So yes, you know. So I always thought I always craved attention. I always craved this kind of not say like fame, but I did crave that at a start. But I realised it's all bullshit because I thought that's where I'd have been felt important. I thought that's where I'd have been. I'm living, yeah, and it's all fucking fake. Mm -hmm. It don't mean shit when you break it all down. All these people live on electronic numbers on a screen to make sure that they're feeling important that day, or they're feeling like a loser. And it's sad because how many likes or comments you get in a post can ruin your whole day or week or month. Some people are suicidal, they don't feel important because they're not sitting here hitting certain numbers as most. And it's a minefield. And that's why social media, as they say, it was the CIA who, who created that. They say the CIA created hip hop as well because it was all violence and hate and smoking and drinking and became normalized. Like mm -hmm. you say, computer games with desensitized dead killings and it's the same as anything music has got different beats in it it's got different waves in it yeah. i think it's 808s it's called but it plays with your emotion and yeah. the, the water inside your body again when you speak like this people think you're fucking crazy and you know what i probably am crazy but it just when you start questioning everything do you ever feel as if you because you would have been paranoid anyway being a bodyguard being an sas you would have been looking for everything slight movements so does it enhance your paranoia or can you stay calm with everything that's going on? You know, it, it, it can enhance it if I'm around it for too long and I, I'll, I can almost sort of uh, trigger myself, you know, to different things and I've got to get, go, get away again. If I'm, uh, even in the social media type stuff that I'm doing now, I've noticed that I've become a bit more edgy, you know, e you know agitated because... I'm, I'm now looking for stories. I'm looking for things. I'm not looking for likes and whatever, but to a degree, as much as I, I, I would hate to admit it, I do like to see that I have more likes and, and, and don't like, and I'm only on one platform, you know, and 
you know, my wife, she warns me of this sort of stuff, so I'm able to put it down, and I, I do have that understanding within myself. But I, what I think I'm doing is is different from the the um, the social media showing my tits for for likes. That's you know a little mm. bit different. You know, this is for what I feel to be um, uh, issues that that are affecting New Zealand. You know, and and that so the more news and crime and everything else. But I'm sure, you know. These these people who are these influencers, for example, you know, it's all about the positive amount of uh, affirmations that they get, and if they don't get them, yeah, they're going to go insane. Yeah. So Blackwater, let's touch on Blackwater. How did that come about? Obviously, in your book it says life, death, and madness in the killing fields of Iraq. What is Blackwater for people who don't know? Blackwater is an American private security company <clears throat> formed by a former Navy SEAL uh, officer called Eric Prince. Um, it became. It was actually a targeting type uh, CQB close quarter battle uh, training facility in uh, Moyoc, in um, in the states. Um, when the Iraq War started, Eric Prince is very Republican. Um, he supported the Republican Party, you know, big time. He uh, applied and got permission to set up a security firm to look after the State Department contracts in in Iraq. So the State Department had a big part to play in. in in the way Americans did everything uh, in in the in Iraq, um, so he provided security, or his people su- su- provided security for Paul Bremer, who was the Bush's representative in in Iraq in Baghdad, um, and then from there, you know, uh, it became uh, he got other contracts, you know, with different other agencies with the three letters to do other sorts of things, and then the company expanded and expanded. How I got involved into it was when I first went to Iraq, I was actually in the Philippines doing some training, and, um, you know, the war started, and we were watching because we heard rumors that uh, private contractors would be allowed to come and, and, and do some of the stuff. Now, back in those days, there, were, there wasn't private contractors. There was mercenaries, okay? And really the only people who, who did that sort of work was... South Africans, or, or the British, and what they called the circuit, you know, and the circuit back in the 70s and the 80s was you'd go to the Congo, you'd go to Angola, you know, and you'd fight with Mad Mike Hoare and lots of people, you know, um, back in, you know, basically jungle warfare and, and whatever else. Private contractors was uh, was to help provide the security for those in the rebuilding process of Iraq after they'd finished completely destroying everything it had to be built again. And Dick Cheney and his, you know, he goes, well, you know, there's a lot more money in destroying everything and rebuilding it, so we, those guys are going to need security. I went over with a company called uh, Custer Battles, providing close protection for some guys uh, as they did their daily job, uh, their their daily work. And and I was very disillusioned. The money wasn't good. The the equipment wasn't good. But no, I'm, I'll back one off of it. The money was good because I was earning no money at the time. So two hundred dollars a day from earning zero dollars a day was fantastic. Um, one of the guys within Custer Battles was very disillusioned as well, like the rest of us, and he reached out. He was an ex-Navy SEAL. He reached out to Eric Prince and said, well, there's a huge opportunity here for security for the rebuilding process. You don't need the um, the high-level security clearances you do for the State Department because these aren't State Department contracts and there's more, you know, millions and millions of dollars more that you can be making. Um, he was given the green light, so he had these different interviews, and uh, he, you know I was the only non-American in Custer Battles, so I arranged to have a meeting with this guy, and uh, he was former SEAL Team Six, which is their Tier One um, within the SEALs, and SAS of course is Tier One as well. So he knew of my background, and, and we started talking, and I said, well, you know, you mind if I join you in forming up this new wing? He said, yeah, of course. You know, come on board. And I said, well, here's another thing. You know, do you mind if I uh, I become the team leader? And, and I said, you know, I'm the only tier one guy here with you, so you know the standard I'm, I'm trained to. No one else is. And he said, yeah, I have no problem with that. And then he goes, well, do you know how much we're going to be earning now? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, $600 a day. You know, my balls jumped into my throat, and I was <clears throat> yeah, I can handle that. You know, really, I was doing flips and cartwheels. And then one day, you know, one night we just, sorry, we uh, we all handed our resignation into Custer Battles, jumped in a couple of soft skin SUV Suburbans and drove off to uh, 
the Alhambra Hotel in, in Karada in Baghdad and formed Blackwater Commercial. Yeah. What was that like? That was, you know, and that was great. That was really good. It was it was like a weight had been lifted off. We had no guns. We had no armor. We had absolutely nothing. And the military prepares you for that, believe it or not, because, you know, you can make the most out of a crappy situation and you've got something in your brain that says, you know, I'm going to make this work. And that's how it sort of started with us. The guy who set it up, um, I won't mention his name, you know, he, he put me in charge of all the guys and we were running around buying guns with what little money we had. Um, buying, you know, we had, there was no armor, there was nothing. Uh, he was looking for contracts. So when, when he found contracts, we'd go out and we'd do them and we'd start to make a little bit more money and a little bit more money. And then it came to the point where, okay, uh, Moyox realized that we were actually quite a viable option in another part of the company that can be uh, making money for it. So we got the green... Uh, another green light, which basically said, okay, well, here's the finance that you guys are going to need in order to to run this show. Um, and it was it was starting something from nothing with just an idea and improving its you know proving its worth and making it work it was quite a quite a good sense of achievement. What was the story with your the friends? I don't know if they get burned alive or they get mm -hmm. hung in the, the town centre. What was mm -hmm. that story? And when was that? Yeah, that was in April, uh, end of April 2004. So when I when I first came back, so we did we did uh, November December 2003, aka um, the Blackwater commercial. We had we had no money at all. We were just trying to be viable. I met I, I met one of the guys, Jerry, um, and we started the uh, sorry. So I'm going to start again, mate. Yeah. Um, so I met Jerry in January, sorry, of 2004. I'd already been with Blackwater for the end of November and December of 2003. Um, and we did close protection together in, in, uh, in Kabbalah and, and, and Baghdad and all that. Now, when we finished around April, Jerry was put in, in charge of a team to escort some, um, catering flatbed trucks. You know, we had, oh, Blackwater Commercial had won a contract with, uh, a company that supplied catering products for um, for the different military bases. They went out on a job, and um, it was meant to take 48 hours, 72 max, but they were to be tasked with um, escorting some flatbed trucks to one of the marine bases in uh, Fallujah. Now, Fallujah at that time was a no-go area. Everybody knew that. You know, you stay away from Fallujah, they will kill you. You know, they, it was the graveyard for Americans. All the insurgency was was taking root there. All the uh, foreign fighters that were coming into Iraq were going to Fallujah for their training and everything else like that. And um, the Americans were actually furnishing weapons and uh, training to the Iraqi police, who were also insurgents in Fallujah. You know, they wore both hats, so they were being well armed already, but by the Americans. Anyway, so the guys went through. They went from Taji to. Uh, find this marine base in the outskirts of Fallujah somewhere and they stopped off at the uh, an Iraqi police checkpoint and they asked directions. Now the Iraqi checkpoint was, um, and they were insurgents as well, just wearing the uniforms. They directed them through Fallujah. When, when they drove through, it was completely undermanned and not really well uh, properly prepared. There was two guys in the front vehicle in a soft skin Pajero uh, SUV, three flatbed trucks, nothing on them, and one soft skin Pajero in the back with another two guys. Okay, so there was no rear cover, there was no side covers, there was only two guys facing forward. They drove through. The Iraqi police called up the insurgency, say, hey, we've got a very soft target coming through, and so they set up an ambush. When the uh, when they when the when the convoy drove into town, and they were well hemmed in because there was also very high um, medium barriers between the lanes, so they couldn't drive or jump you know, from one lane to another. They had blocked off the front, they had blocked off the back. The uh, insurgents snuck up behind the, f the front, sorry, the insurgents snuck up behind the back two guys, shot them in the head, shot them in the back, killed them, stripped them of their, their guns and armor. Uh, the two guys in the front heard the gunfire uh, and then went to spin it around, busted the tires, got stuck, they got shot, they got killed, their weapons got stripped off them. And um, 
the you know the attackers left, and then the crowd, the the Fallujah population started beating, burning them, setting them on fire, um, and did all the carnage that we saw on TV, and then uh, strung two of them up from um, the bridge. They had burnt corpses over the bridge in uh, the of the Euphrates River. I was in the team house, and I I, I cover this in the book, and. Um, one of the women who was our housekeeper, Rose, she let out this almighty scream when she was cleaning. She saw it happening live on TV or on TV. And so we came in to see what she was looking at. And um, I had this really, you know, I sort of looked at, that looks like one of our vehicles because I was very familiar with them. I've been driving around in damn things. And um, so I was asking, you know, I said, you know, any, anybody heard from the guys who, who went to Taji? And, and no one had. And so we started watching, we were watching it and watching it. And then, of course, it dawned on me, it said, you know, those are our guys. And I, I, I again, described the emotions I was going through was it was like, because up to then, Iraq was still relatively safe. I mean, yeah, you, you, you risked it, but there wasn't anywhere near the amount of attacks that happened after that. That was the main change, pivotal point in that whole war uh, was when our guys got killed in Fallujah. Before, it was... Someone would shoot at us, you know, we'd have to do whatever we had to do. Now it was it was kind of war. We were now involved in it. And as I say in the book, we were we were no longer contractors. We were mercenaries now. You know, you do that to us, we're going to do that to you. Was that the first time you'd lost anyone? That was the first time, yes. And it was quite horrific. And the way it was done. And that was the way that really shocked me. It was the way it was done. You know, sure, if if the... If the attackers had just shot and then the guys had died, you know, that's just the way it is, you know. Bad guy versus good guy, you know, shooter versus shooter, not a problem. But it was the desecration of the bodies and the and the and the the joy they took out of it, and the uh, you know the fanaticism and the it was that that was the really shocking part. You know, to, to a lot of us, it was like, well, we're here to help you. You know, we're here, you know, yes, we are also part of the problem, you know, because we're part of the invading force, depends on how you look at it, but we're not soldiers. We're here to provide security for those who are here to help you, so we're here to help you as well. And that's what you're going to do to us? Well, okay. What happened after that? Well, we rode a lot harder. We uh, we stopped being as friendly as we were. We took no chances. Um, Blackwater itself became, let's say, uh, well... We smiled a lot less, and we we started to sort of really taking the job seriously. There were no friendly Iraqis to us, you know. Women and children, yeah, not a problem. Any Iraqi man, anyone with a gun, anything anything that could be a threat, we treated it as a threat. And we would we sort of would we weren't murderers by any stretch of the imagination, but we weren't we weren't taking risks either. Everybody became an enemy. Everybody became an enemy, yeah. How does that then change everything inside of you to then see the world full of hate and rage? It fucks you up. Mm -hmm. Did you see a change in you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And um, it's it's like, let me see, what's, what's it like? It's it's Here's an example, for example. You know, when, when, when you used to drive from Biop down Route Irish, which was the road that took you from Biop to the uh, CPA, um, it's a it was a six mile stretch of road, all right. It became the most dangerous set of you know stretch of road in the world. There were attacks on it every single day. You know you'd be driving down there and it'd be just like Mad Max. You'd be shooting people, would be shooting at you. You know, so you knew what you're in for driving down that road. We, we our team we had music that would play to gear us up. You know, and ours ours was Prodigy, Breathe. You know, and before we left. You know, ding, 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 ding. And then as we hit the road, boom, 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 you know where it goes. And we were just, we were going to kill anything that came, you know, that we thought, you know, was going to try and kill us. When we got to the other end, we turned it off and you switched it off. You know, you became, once we were behind the walls, you know, you relaxed. That relaxing became sort of less and less. And, you know, every night we would sit around the table and would drink beers and would celebrate making it for a day. You know, and I never used to drink every day. I'd drink only in the weekend, uh, one night, and I'd get so fucking hammered that I made it for the days that I missed. But we would have we would have beers, and only up to ten o'clock. I was a team leader, so I made sure that rule was applied to. But we'd jam as many as we could in before 
10 o'clock and we'd go out and do work the next day. And you, you, uh, even, even that kind of, you're really only bearing, you're only, you're only bearing your emotions because, again, a rule that I in place was we didn't talk about family, we didn't talk about religion, and we didn't talk about what we thought of the war because, A, uh, we, were, we didn't want to get that close to somebody even though we were close teammates and brothers, you know, who may be dead tomorrow. You know, we didn't want to get to know about anyone's family so much in case we had to go and tell their wife that, you know, I was with your, your husband or your father when he got shot or got blown up. And the religious one was because, like, uh, that was just a waste of time. I mean, I'm an atheist and it didn't concern me, you know, and yeah. a lot of what happened became religious, you know. Do you think that's why then you became a recluse, kind of a solo kind of? Yes. Because it's easier, you don't feel that pain as much if you feel as if you don't want to get as close to them? Yes. Yeah. It is much easier. Um, it's the only person you have to process it to is yourself. But again, I mean, it's the only other person who suffers really is your wife, you know, and your partner, because she, can, my wife could see over the years the deterioration in me. And the drinking was a way of helping bury it. But, I mean, it's just like a volcano, you know, it's just building up pressure down below and then one day it's going to come bursting out again, you know. So all that sacrifice, though, the question for what then? Like you say, from the loved ones not being there as a father, having a broken relationship, the question, all that, what you went through to then, what it, it takes to then becoming a loner? Because, you've, because everything in life for me, <clears throat> it is family. Everything is having that loved one, is having... The stable household. Listen, I've not got it. I've got kids to fucking multiple women. I've got, but I understand the way. If I had the right method, that's everything that I've wanted was the family, stability, the guidance, the discipline for the kids, the understanding of life. Now I'm in a great place to do this, but it's took fucking forty years. But then, <clears throat> when you're in that life, you're so oblivious to it. You've caught off everything. You've you don't question everything. You're one mindset. You've seen comrades tortured that's that that justifies everything that you're doing but how does it then sacrifice every single person in your life when you're involved in the military yeah you you, you try and compartmentalize everything but i've always had a sort of an opposite kind of way i've always wanted the the stability and be the provider and be a good father but i didn't really care what it took to get there that was my goal the family was, I, I mean, I love my family and I love everything, but I have everything I have now because of what I've done and what I've been through. And I wouldn't like to think where I would be if I hadn't done what I'd done now to get where I am now, if you understand what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. Yeah, of course. So I, I don't regret anything I've done. Um, I regret a lot of things that I've seen and, and, and uh, you know, sort of perhaps the road took a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but I'm in such a good place now uh, for my family, for myself, and I have what I have come out of the end of the tunnel. Um, what I've done to get there doesn't sort of worry me too much, you know. What's the worst thing you've seen in Iraq? Well, okay, now it's not it's, okay. So we used to come back um, to our hotel after our different runs, and uh, again, this is in the book, and it's, it's something that sort of is always with me. Um, let me see. I'm just going to have to slow down here because I can feel emotions. Yeah. Emotions are good. Yeah. Fuck. Anyway, there was this kid. He was uh, maybe nine or ten, same age as um, Same age as my kids. And um, I always wondered why he was hanging out <clears throat> in this burnt out, bombed out building. And um, so I asked one of the guards one day, and he always reminded me of Gollum from Lord of the Rings, right? Fuck me. And um, I used to ask, you know, I used to, we'd try and feed him, we'd give him food, but he, would, he was fucking filthy and dirty ass. And then he um, would scamper back into the uh, into the ruins, and he would never eat anything that we gave him. And um, so then, 
I, I went to one of the guards and I said, so why is that, that kid always there? You know, where's his family? What the fuck is he doing? And why is he always hanging out in that fucking bombed out car park? And the guard said, oh, no, 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 that's not a, it's not a car park. That used to be his house, his apartment block. It got blown up with a bomb one day. You know, fuck knows why it got blown up, but it, it did. And his family are dead and they're still in there. Plus every other family that lived in that apartment block. And so every night he comes out and he, uh, you know, and this night that I saw him, he had a, what I thought was a loaf of bread. But it wasn't. It was a dead pigeon. And it was plucking and he was eating it. And he looked exactly like fucking Gollum. And then he scampered back off into the, uh, into the um, rubber. And, and I, I thought about my kids at home who were exact same age. And I was going, well, that kid's fucked. You know, that he's never going to be the same. And for the, some reason, that always played on my mind. You know, that this fucking thing is just a complete waste of time. You know, it's just absolute destruction for greed. It's absolute destruction for for money. And this is the result of it, you know. And this is going to come back and bite everybody in the ass one day. Because if this had happened in my country or in your country, and of course, I'd form and I'd, end, I'd be in an decision myself. Because all you want is revenge. Yeah, once you see that, like you say, with your two friends being killed and tortured, and you then hating every Iraqi, yeah. they're there doing what they feel as if is a noble thing, is protecting their own because of what the Americans done. Exactly right. So both think they're in the right. You're in, you think they're in the right by hating every Iraqi. The Iraqis, and probably if you sway towards it, the Iraqis are the ones in the right. They're defending the because I don't agree with wars, but if someone came to Scotland to try and invade it, I'm the first one to grab a fucking rifle and try and protect my family. Yeah. By all means necessary. And mm. My job is to pre provide and protect by all fucking means, and whether that's killing or taking life, I don't give a fuck what it is. It's just a natural instinct is to protect. You don't want to ever go down that route. But once you start going down that route and start thinking like that, as soon as you start seeing destruction, like you say, the stuff that you've seen in your life, you have to die with it. I don't know how, because... What is the old saying? They say time is a healer, but it's never the true case because you adapt to the pain. You mm -hmm. learn to fucking live with it. Mm -hmm. but by my own pain and misery in life, I, I still struggle with it. No matter how much I exercise or run or no matter how much shit I eat or no matter what I do or how busy I am at work, here, still pain. No matter if I'm having a good day, it'll remind us, well, wait a minute, look who the fuck ups that you've done, look what the shit that you've seen. And it reminds me that I shouldn't be happy. And I don't ever fucking think I'll get over it. And that's the sad reality of life. No matter what you do, no matter how you try and overcome it, no matter if you do therapy, yes, it heals it a little, but it fucking scars the heart or the soul or whatever it does when you see destruction. 100%, 100%. And writing this book, you know, like I said, you know, what I said previously, my friend said it'd be good for therapy and, you know, cathartic and all that sort of carry on. And as I was writing it, it took me like about three to four years because I was only writing it when I was in a hotel, you know, a bit here and a bit there. And every so often I'd have to stop. Fucking became too emotional and I'd put it away and I wouldn't start again for a month or two and then I'd try and get fucking past that piece. And then when I'd finished it, I actually felt better, right? You know, I felt really good. And, you know, oh my God, I've, I've, I've flushed the toilet of crap. But then you get into the editing process. Oh my God, I've read the fucking thing. <laughs> about nine times and every time I got to the same points I'd well up again and I and I, I mentioned in the book you know there's a, there's a part in it where where the, the US were using depleted uranium you know and uh, I use it as an analogy where the uranium never breaks down it'll be there for fucking tens of thousands of years Okay, so it just sits under the surface and layers of sand, layers of sand will go over the top of it. But as soon as you kick that sand off again, the radium is right there. That's the exact same with the emotion that, you know, you were talking about and you saw with me. You kick the sand and it, it's, it's all right there. I had thought I had quite successfully buried mine before I wrote this, you know. But the more you write it, if you were going to write a book to deal with PTSD... <laughs> Be prepared to go through a lot of PTSD, and mm. I've uh, I only read it yesterday and today. I haven't read the book at all since it came out. I read it yesterday on the plane and today, just to make sure that everything was. And the first time I'd ever read it in the, as a book form. Did was, you ever kill anyone yourself? Yes, I did. 
What was that feeling, killing someone? Um, you know, that was actually that was actually a feeling of achievement uh, to a degree because of the situation that we were in. Um, it was uh, it was at night, had absolutely no vision. Uh, I was being spotted in, by somebody through night vision. They directed me. I couldn't see what I was doing, and um, they were out to try and kill me and and those of us who were there. And I got to them before they got to me. And one of the big things I, I sort of cover in the book is when I'm dealing with death or I see death, um, as, a, as a way of trying to deal with it is like, I, as long as it's them and it's not me, I don't give a fuck, you know. But when I did do that, you know, I did question am I perpetuating the circle of, of violence because I've killed somebody who's got a father, brother, son, whatever. Uh, their children now are going to join the insurgency. They had killed a military soldier. It was their brother and sister now going to join the military to kill insurgents. It's, see how it creates that cycle of never ending. So, yeah, it was it was something I didn't really dwell on. It didn't really affect me as, as much as the kid or other things that I've seen. So it was just sort of like part and parcel with the job. It's crazy that you think that would be the main one that would trigger you. But again, if you're signing up to be a soldier, for me it's free game. But again, you question why you're there as well. But it's a difficult one because I interviewed a man called Craig Harrison, unbelievable man, really struggles. He was uh, the world's longest sniper kill. I think it was over like, 1.5 miles. I don't know if that record's been broken now. Um, killed over 80 people. Absolute machine, just robotic, do his job. I think the Iraqis are, whatever he was, put a bounty out in his head for a a lot of money because of the destruction he was causing he's struggling battling but he wants to go back into a war zone and kill again because it feels more at peace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can i can believe that yeah i mean you know i went to libya after that after i think i'd never go back into uh, another one it's it's you know i've been to west africa i've been to central africa you know that's it's possible yeah i've been to ukraine you know, I'm looking at Haiti now. <laughs> it's, I understand where he's coming from. I don't have that same struggle with killing, though, that he does. I didn't get anywhere near those numbers, and, and uh, he's a super soldier and, and wish him all the best. Mine is more, mine is more sort of, you know, dealing with, the, with, with what I saw and what I went through back there and the, and the friends and the brothers that I lost. And... It's not about, for me, wanting to get over there and kill anymore. It's just about sort of like feeling relevant still, um, feeling, you know, the camaraderie, you know, and I'm getting older. You know, if I want to do it before I can no longer do it, um, but am I being stupid? You know, it's, it's quite possible. Um, but you never sort of lose that itch to sort of to want to do it, I, I don't think anyway. Yeah. What is that adrenaline? Is that ego? What is that it drives? Is that you're finding your peace and yeah. pain instead of you've got the family life, you don't need that life, but you're so used to the misery and the pain it probably stops the demons. Like, how is that mindset with it? How do you separate normality and with reality? Yeah, it's it's that is a tricky one. Um and I, I think I have a better, you know, those of us who have done it. You know, you, you, don't, you don't believe the bullshit and the propaganda anymore from the politicians or anything like that. You know, and you, and you still want that you, that sort of adrenaline buzz and that com camaraderie and everything else, but you don't want to be that fucking heavyweight boxer coming back for one last fight and getting the shit smashed out of you and everybody thinks you're an idiot. You know, you should have known when to hang up your gloves. Um, I don't think I'm ready you know, I'm at a point, despite my age, to, to hang up my gloves. I mean, there's no way I can run around the hills with a pack on my back anymore. But... Um, I still think that my knowledge and everything that I've been through is can still contribute, um, you know, and, and until I find that, you know, I'm, I've now turned out to be the silly old fucker that, you know, I used to think some of the old guys in Iraq used to be, then I'll, I'll still have that urge to keep wanting to do it, I suppose. Like, for me also, I get the same feeling. Like when I watch a rugby game, for example, you know, I'm, I'm watching it on TV, I can feel my toes... <clears throat> You know, I'm I'm getting involved in it. You know, whoever watches the sport, they 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 used to play where they love. You know, it's like you know, you I want to get out there and do it. 
I still have that, you know. Is there anybody you can speak to? Obviously, if you speak to the older generation again to give you advice and say, look, because you already know the answers. Yeah. You already know what you should be doing. But it's something ingrained in you where it's never going to switch off, ever. So yeah. when do you switch it off? Like you say, it's the boxers looking back at 50. Mike Tyson's fighting again, nearly 60. Is that the natural instincts of human just to always fight? Or is that something that we condition ourselves to think that we should always be fighting? Because the natural instinct for a human, we shouldn't be seeing destruction. We shouldn't be seeing pain. We shouldn't be seeing death. Because look where it takes you. Mm. That's not... If you look at a baby that's been born, it's pure, it's yes. innocent, the energy, the vibration, everything's just an essence of greatness and what can be. If everybody was to come out and the world just be peaceful, 8 billion people helping each other, helping each other build things, learning new cultures, the way I think it should be, you, you don't need to be stuck in little environments in your own little way, weird way where you think this is the only life. Like, once you start travelling as well, I've been blessed enough to travel the world and meet different cultures and beliefs and not under, not believe what the media is saying because these people are actually good. I've just bought into the bullshit that I thought you were all bad, same as yourself. You've seen innocent well, well, soldiers being tortured and you think, I hate these bastards. It justifies everything that you're doing. But how do you then... It's, uh, like, humans... Like, I'm going off key here, but we are good. And when you are born, you've got an innocence. But then how do you then switch off with then going, wait a minute... Do I love my life or do I want to be? Because you're not 20 anymore. Listen, you look great for 60, by the way. You look fucking phenomenal. <laughs> but is that is that psychotic behaviour then? To a degree, I think it is. Yeah. And always wanting to prove to yourself you're your own biggest critic as well. Uh, I think, you know, I I am to myself. I mean, there is a certain degree of vanity um, in just the way I keep myself fit and, and everything else like that. And I think anybody of... Uh, it's not a bad thing, providing it's not it's not overdone. Um, when, particularly, I do love seeing people my age when they can't see their dick because their their belly's <laughs> their belly's so far over it. You know, even now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, without a belt, their pants would slide off because mm -hmm. they don't have an ass. You know, stuff <laughs> like that. And and I do take a little bit of pride in that that uh, I'm not there yet. Um, but you know, it's it's when you and I have everything I need. That's the thing. I don't need this this to go away and do all this. But also, if I'm asked, I don't want to say no because my, my brothers have asked me and they, they think I'm going to con contribute and help them. And also, I was a, uh, I mean, I think I was, I was a pretty effective leader in Blackwater, you know, and I still have guys who thank me for, you know, being in the team. And I mean, and they were part of my success because it wasn't just me on my own. So if they have, they think they have the confidence in me to sort of want to help them out in a situation, I think it's my obligation to sort of think about going first and, and then perhaps thinking about why I can't later, but I, I don't want to let them down. I was just about to say that there. Do you feel as if you would let them down if you said no and something happened? Yes. Would you live with a regret then? Well, yes, and that's, that's again, that's that's also, I think, part of that every soldier has. It's, you know, it's a, it's a survivor's guilt to a degree. I was asked if I could help uh, these guys on their trip uh, before they went into Fallujah. Um, the guy who was one of the ones who got hung from the bridge, I'd worked with him for two months in, on, in another contract, and I, I, again, I, I cover all this, and I didn't want to work with him. I mean, I could have gone, and I could have used my team, and perhaps we could have made a difference. So there's always that, you know, well, what if I had, perhaps volunteered myself and, and my team, would I have made a difference or would I also be hanging from a fucking bridge? Mm. You know, and there is there is a bit of that. I also had a friend, you know, he shot himself, you know, and had I, could I, could I have done something to uh, maybe talk to him a bit more and he wouldn't have done it? I don't know. There's always the what ifs, you know. Do you see much suicide in that line of work you do? Yes especially now, 20 years on, 20 odd years on, it's still there. We've had guys die, but we've had guys do some stupid shit. Um, you know, in fact, one of the boys, you know, he got caught, he didn't do it, he had a pistol in his mouth after reading the book, you know, because it kicked the sand. You know, brought up all the bad memories that he was going through. So, yeah, we get a lot of suicide, yeah. Sad that, isn't it? It's uncalled for. 
completely uncalled for because there there are means and and and, and ways out there to, to deal with that. And and it brings me on to sort of writing the book to show that if I'm going through this bullshit, you know, cool. talk about it. I'm very lucky with my wife. She understands fully. She's been with me the whole time through it. I have her to sort of, if I feel like talking to her about it, that I can and she understands. It's not mocked. I can talk to my friends in a more mature manner. It's not the young kid bravado, you know, have a beer, get over it. We actually have proper conversations about it and, and, and help each other. And it's when you break down those sort of barriers of uh, it's a subject that you, 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 you know, you can talk about, um, you really do help. But you can only do so much. It's up to yourself too. You have to find find ways and, and, and coping mechanisms within yourself. You know, I I play golf, you know, because I don't like being around people. It's a four-hour game. I play my golf with my buddies. I have a, a non-beer because I don't drink alcohol, but then I leave. Anything longer, I've got to go. I've, and I'll go back up to my house on the hill and I'll sit there with my dogs and I'll have a cigar and, you know. Your pain's away. Yes. How important is it to talk? Very important. So important. And sometimes I can do it easily and sometimes I can't. I did not realize how hard it would be since writing this, you know, and it's really helped. And I, I realized, because I was quite happy to live another life after this and not, not even talk about my time in Iraq or anywhere else that I've been to. And because and, no one else knew. I was working and I was living in the States. Those people didn't know my background. So it was quite easy to sort of shut that door and live this. Since I've written this, everyone's going, well, I had no idea you, you'd you gone through all of this. I had no idea you'd, you'd been here, here and everywhere else, you know. And it opened up these doors. And then, of course, people want to talk to me about it. And it becomes kicking the sand, kicking the sand, kicking the sand. And there's a benefit to that. I have sort of didn't want to do it, but it's kind of forced me to do it. And um, there's a lot of people, a lot of the brothers are struggling because mm -hmm. they have no one to talk to or they're still in that mindset there that it's not manly enough to talk to. They'd never cry in front of somebody else and I have no control over it. But uh, I would sooner not do it, but it's um, it's nothing that becomes any easier to stop either, mm. you know. Well, it's sad. We do a lot of homeless work back in Scotland and majority is ex-military. And it yes. breaks your heart because I always say it like they're up, they're going away and willing to die for people, but yet nobody's willing to die for them when they come back. And it's fucking sad because <clears throat> everybody's lost. It's mm -hmm. not just military; it's everybody in a whole. Nobody really knows what the fuck is going on. Yes, and I always say this: that like we change. Look, like why are we here? Why the fuck are we here? Me and you sitting here. Like yeah. Why? If, who's what's created us? What's put us here? Why is this connected? Like, what the fuck is it all about? Sometimes, it, for me, I think, I, I look at it as maybe avatars. Maybe this is a computer game. Just so advanced where it feels real. It just doesn't add up to me. It doesn't make sense. Right. Do we choose this life before we get into it? And if there was a God, then why the fuck is there so much destruction and pain and suffering? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And I do question it. Sometimes I can lay at night, lay in bed at night, 10 o'clock, ready to go for an early night, and it's 4 a.m. and I'm watching fucking shit on YouTube about tombstones and fucking pyramids and aliens and you can go down the route of i do question a lot but so it's unhealthy as well yeah because i should be living who gives a fuck i think we watch the same stuff yeah <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what i'm saying yeah, it's yeah. like why am i thinking like this yeah it was beer and cocaine back in the day yeah and it made sense yeah, that yeah. was me living i right. thought i was the man yeah i thought i was the fucking billy big bollocks and now I look how deranged I was thinking then. Yeah. And now am I going to be sitting again in five, 15 years thinking, fuck me, you were deranged even more so? It's a hard one. Yeah, it's a real hard one. And, um, you know, and, and, and you, I have to stop myself as well. I mean, I watch fucking things on pyramids and, and I do exactly the same stuff. I watch exactly the same stuff. And I question as to what, what the fuck are we doing? You know? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the best time, I mean, COVID was terrible. But what was the best thing that came out of it? Look how quickly the planet forgot about us and started to regenerate itself and clean itself up oh. we're, we're nothing but a fucking tick on its ball sack yeah you know as soon as we're gone the planet's going to have a big sigh of relief and go oh well we've got rid of those idiots for a few million years before the next lot turn yeah. see i don't know if that we get so advanced in a way where something just wipes us out and then we just reproduce again from day one and kind of go through it all again i genuinely do not know i've interviewed everyone 
from anybody from all different walks of life the billionaires the homeless man and nobody's ever gave me the answers mm -hmm. and i don't know if i'll ever find the answer sometimes i go out and search for myself but then i contradict myself by driving a nice car and wearing nice watches because i know it's all bullshit yeah it's all fucking fake podcasts it's fucking what what is it to be number one the biggest the best the constant hustle the constant stresses it puts on my mindset and I believe men should be hustlers. I believe we should be fighters to a degree. But shake hands after it. Yeah. Same as the men who are causing wars. Get the fucking guys in suits to be fighting. Go and fucking fight it out yourself. Yeah. And see who the tougher man is. And then after it, shake your hands. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. So see when you're going through all that then, when when did the penny drop? When did you ask your, the questions of what the fuck are you doing? How I Well, actually, sort of during my time in Iraq. Was that when that was? Yes, during my time in Iraq, and I and I um, was questioning what I was doing, uh, and was I contributing to the problem? And I was, I think, and I sort of believe I came up with an answer. But what was I willing to do to change it? Well, absolutely nothing, because the money was making it a bearable pain that I could put up with. You know, it was provide it was providing me with a means to finally provide for my family like I always wanted. It was getting me to my goal. And I and I was doing it on the backs, you know, of the, of the Iraqi people. But I didn't mind because I could turn that off while every day I was making $600 getting to my goal. Then once I got to my goal, then I could provide for my family. And that was the price that they were paying for me to get to where I need to be. And um, if I started questioning it too much, you know, it, that became, you know, uh -huh. turn it off, just get on with the job question it later on yeah because listen i've got a great life but listen it was nowhere near the life that you were living then to get the dollar but we've been to six seven different countries this year i've been a lot of, spent a lot of time away from my family because i'm thinking i want to provide them a life but the biggest provider you can have in life is being there yeah is being present yeah. and that's the fucking contradiction because i'm battling with myself to be the biggest to be the best to learn how to interview to learn different techniques and how to create stories but while i'm doing that it's taking me away even when i'm home i'm not switching off because i'm thinking about the next interview where i need to be next and i'm not present with my kids the family only time i'm present is with them, with my dog but and if i'm honest the dog makes me happy i feel it bliss because i feel as if he doesn't want fuck all from me he just wants my time he's not going to fuck me over and not saying my family do that but i just feel more at peace when i'm with animals when i just feel i just feel fucking amazing and but I question why the travel, why so much? But then again, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't provide for the other things. But again, we're not always going to be here long. And the most valuable currency is time. No, no. And I think that's not unhealthy to think that way. And, and I think that way myself. Because I know people, for example, you know, when I was in the SAS, uh, you know, it took us away all the time. We were, we were away all the time. And, you know, guys got out, you know, I, my, I've got to spend more time with the family. They became fucking miserable. <laughs> and the kids hated them because they were home all the time sitting on their ass, you know. They, they, they got out to spend more time with the family. They became resentful because now they were with the family. Because they were with the family so much, they, be, they didn't become special. They were just normal fucking dad's home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Took it for granted. Yeah, took it for granted. You know, so I, I, I don't think it's an unhealthy way of thinking. We, we as providers have to take the risks that we think are going to help us get to where we have to be in order to make the lives that we didn't have for our children a lot better. Mm -hmm. And we don't all want to go to the grave knowing that our kids are now going to be struggling because we didn't set them up with something or we didn't provide for them. Um, we want to, you know, we want to sort of, provide for them and, and whatever by whatever means sometimes yeah you know, that's what we have to do yeah do you have nightmares all the time yeah all the time well no sorry i won't say all the time less less a lot less hmm. um used to be all the time you know and 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 the one thing with my book it's it's not a it's not a shoot 'em up book it's not a book about you know waving the american it's not a fucking michael bay movie you know where we're riding off over you know saving the day and all that shit it's about it's about everything i saw everything i went through 
as a non-American in an American company in an American environment, um, which I absolutely loved. Don't worry about that. But the the price I paid for it as well. So and the and and we, you know, the price my brothers paid for it, and my American friends paid for it, and my New Zealand friends and English friends, you know, British friends, paid for it. The price we paid for it in total to do that, and it it covers, it covers the sort of mental breakdown I went through and what I did to recover from that and the breakdown on now my, my marriage and what I did to myself to recover from that. And I was lucky enough that I had a wife who, who gave me some tough love and it made me pull my head out of my ass and decide, you know, what am I doing? You know? How do you accept love from, especially from a woman? It's probably easier to love a companion, a brother for some reason, because if you, if you know they've got your back, but a woman's love is different. Yes. It makes you question life. It makes you question love. Because as old man, I believe we're the most sensitive beings on the planet as men. Women are stronger. Oh, for sure. And, I, and I've always said that, and I get shit for it, but the way women hold hold themselves, the way they can handle pain, the way they can operate, we're much more sensitive than women. But how do you handle love then? How do you not get scared? Because you say you fly solo. Do you ever get scared that they leave? Because I struggle with abandonment. I struggle with, I'm very good at making people fall in love with me, mm -hmm. but never last the pace because I feel as if I can get hurt again. Mm -hmm. So I just, it's easier for me to end everything before it ever really has anything meaning to it. The one, the one thing I do have is a very dark sense of humour. And everyone who knows me knows I have a dark sense of humour. And my wife knows that for sure. You know, I, 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 I do things and talk to her in one way that, uh, you know, some relationships she wouldn't get around. She just, she is strong as fuck. My wife is as strong as fuck, believe me. And she can give as good as she takes. And she knows when I'm just sort of taking the piss out of her. And, and then she'll question me sometimes. And, and, and I'll tell her, you know, it was sort of, you know, I can replace you any, any day of the week, you know. And she knows, she knows damn well that I'd be fucked without her, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I, and and we, when we when we separated after um, <coughs> you know when I was really losing my shit, you know she said herself, well, I didn't think that you'd want me back, kind of thing. And I said, I. That was the one thing that made me keep going to go forward, was to was to want you back. You know what I mean? But I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be the person that you wanted me to be, and I could have quite easily. I had two choices when we separated. Um, many, many years ago because of my drinking was completely out of hand and, and it was horrible. Um, and I was on a contract in Sudan and um, I was writing sort of really stupid emails, getting drunk, saying stupid shit. So she gave me an ultimatum, you know, sort your act out or don't come home. And of course I thought, you know, oh fuck, who do you, you know, I can do whatever I want. Carried on drinking and then she said, don't come home. And then at the end of the contract, uh, everybody flew out of Kenya and I'm the only fucking idiot standing at the airport, sort of, well, hang on, I've got nowhere to go and no one to go home to, you know. Um, I wasn't living in New Zealand and there's no way I would, would want to go back to New Zealand to live. Um, so I was forced to sort of be by myself. Luckily, I can be by myself, but I, I had two choices. One was, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to carry on drinking and start a new life here in Africa, or take this opportunity and sort my problems out and become a better man and, and fix my issues because I wasn't happy. I'd drink all night and I'd wake up. I'd be puffy, sweaty, bloated, feeling like shit, you know, or I could clean up my act and become a better, a better man and a better human being for, for the person I want to be that better person for. And that was my wife. Did you know you were slipping with the booze? Oh, for sure. How bad did it get? It got so bad that if I was drinking and I remembered what I did the night before, I wasn't drinking hard enough. You know, it was, there's 400 beers in the fridge. Holy fuck, is that all? We need more. It was, uh, it was, it wasn't even enjoyable anymore. Now, I'm not going to say I was an alcoholic because I didn't drink every day, but I was certainly probably one of the brackets that would class me as one. I was a super binge drinker, you know. When I drank, it was one night, and by fuck, it was a heavy night. That can just, just be as bad and do more damage. Exactly, yeah. What was it like making the changes from that, and why? How that came about was pretty life-changing. Obviously, it was, it was very life-changing for me. I, I was told not to come home, 
So I rented a cottage in um, in Karen, in, in a suburb in Nairobi, Kenya. And I was going to the gym, and I'd I'd got into um, to doing uh, movies, uh, military advising on you know, on movies, and I'd been asked to do a movie. Um, the, so I was getting myself in shape to do what I, I needed to do. But during the day, I was, you know, a little bit bored, and I was messing around inside this cottage, and I found a book called Shantaram by uh, David Gregory Roberts, an Australian guy. And I had a look at the size of this fucking thing, and I went, oh, this is huge. I'm never going to finish this, but what else do I have to do? So I started reading it, and it's about how he had to escape from Australia after being a heroin addict, and he escaped to New Zealand, and his friends in New Zealand set him up and sent him to India. And this is like in the early 80s. And um, how he found purpose living in the slums with no one that he knew. He'd run away from his past. He'd cleaned up his act and how what he did to help those people and what they did to help him and how it made him a better human being and, and, and you know, sort of see a purpose for his life. And as I'm reading this book, I, I was able to resonate with every single character and everything that he wrote because it was exactly what I was doing. I had basically was running away from, you know, what I was, what I was my, my addiction, I suppose. I was in a foreign country. And uh, I was I was in a very similar situation, and when I finished reading the book, I said I'm never going to touch another drop of alcohol again, and then uh, I haven't. Yeah, fair play. It's funny because as men, one thing that we are is very stubborn. Yeah, but it's like a self harming because we're too fucking stubborn. Instead of sorting things out, like you say, you'd rather stay in Africa yourself, knowing there is no future there for you. You're doing nothing with your life. You're going to die alone. Yeah. Instead of putting your hands out, admitting that we're fucking up, admitting that we're in the wrong, admitting. And we're not always wrong. Let's fucking not get it twisted. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes women are fuckers and pains in the asses, especially when they're on their period. You just think, fuck me. Like, and I've got, I had my mother, my sister, my daughter. They're all fucking ganging up me. And you think, fuck off, because we've still got pure ego and pride. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, I'll not be short of telling people to fuck off, no matter who it is or, or where it is. But. There's so much stubbornness and I feel that myself. That I just think if somebody gives me like an automatum or a options, I think, fuck off, I'll do it myself. Even though it's killing me inside, mm -hmm. the pain. But I don't care because I'm so stubborn and I think I'll figure it out. No, no, I'm very stubborn. My wife will say, you you know, you say no just for the sake of saying no. Mm -hmm. You know, like for example, you know, she'll say, I don't know, the other day, you know, do you want some of this cake? And I'll say no. And I fucking really do. You know, and she said, you just said no because you always say no. But now you really want some, don't you? And I go, no, I don't want any of your fucking cake, you know. But really inside, I, oh, I'm exactly the same, you know. Mm -hmm. Stubborn as fuck. But I, I put my hand up. I, I I was only hurting myself and my family and everything else and everything that I had. I knew what I could have and would be good. I knew where I wanted to be and how I was behaving and what I was doing was going to stop that. So I, I did have to put my hand up in Shandaram was the catalyst was a kick in the balls that I needed to to say fuck you know you're not doing this alone you weren't the, you're not the only person who have ever gone through this so take this guy's advice take his story and uh and move forward with it but we do feel alone and we feel as if it's only us who are battling these struggles and, and that's the fucking scary thing because everybody battles everybody struggles yes and that's the what people need to understand you ain't alone but it's reaching out and having taking away your pride to say that you're struggling, say that you're scared. And it's okay speaking about it, but sometimes you've got to put the wheels into motion and do something about it also. You know what I'm saying? Exercise, give up the drink, give up the drugs, eat a little better, and you'll start feeling a little better. But if you're still struggling, by all means, fucking seek help. But I think a lot of people cause their own trauma and pain. No, they do. And as men, we always feel as if we've got it figured out, but we're, we're fucking hundred years behind <laughs> well i mean and and that's exactly right and if you don't i mean you're going to end up like some of you know some of the people i've known in the past you know they put the put a gun in their mouth what is a mercenary for people who don't know well a mercenary in the old definition of the term is as uh, someone who will, who will fight um not necessarily of their their own country but for money you know just go to a war and if it pays enough they'll use their skills to um you know to earn the money and achieve the goal you know uh -huh. they don't care what it takes there's no scruples there's no loyalty 
it's just to the dollar. And you've got a license to kill? There's no licenses to kill. But you can kill? I have. Yeah, but you can? You Does can. anybody... No, not all, not all mercenary groups are legal. You know, back in the past, they, they weren't necessarily legal. Um, you know, you had the ones with Simon Mann and all those sorts of, you know, back in the Wonga Wonga, uh, Wonga, Wonga days of, you know, weren't necessarily legal, which is why they spent time in jail once they got caught. Um, the Iraq War made it legal, you know, which is why it's probably never happened again. You know, you had Wagner Group with the Russians, you know, and now they shit the bed. You know, uh, they made it legal. But in the days, no, not necessarily legal. So just a free for all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you came out, then are you you're still not out though, are you? You're not really out of it. You're still no, doing I'm jobs not. if you get asked. Yes, if I'm asked. Yes. When did you start getting into movies and stuff? Because you're not like directing fights and like Lord of the Rings and. I was in Lord of the Rings. I was I was a stuntman. <laughs> you know, I was a stuntman in Lord of the Rings, um, and. Uh, then I lived in in Amman, Jordan. I mean, everybody in New Zealand was in Lord of the Fucking Rings. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, you can't find a Kiwi that mm -hmm. wasn't in Lord of the Rings. But I was a stunt man in Lord of the Rings. Um, so yeah, we were doing all the fight scenes and the battle scenes. Um, then uh, I was living in Jordan, and an old Blackwater buddy of mine, um, he knew uh, Mark Bowling and, and Catherine Bigelow, and Mark writes a um, uh, a bit about the book on, on the back of it there. Um, and uh, they filmed the Hurt Locker in, in Iraq. So I did the military advising and security um, and a little bit of acting in that. <coughs> and uh, Ray Fiennes was, was there, and we did the contractor scene out in the desert where it turns out to be a, a big uh, gunfight. And then Ray Fiennes did a movie called Coriolanus uh, over in Serbia, so he asked if I'd do the, the military advising on that. So I, I went and did that with him as well. And then Mark and Catherine also did Zero Dark Thirty about the killing of um, Osama bin Laden. So I did the military advising and security, and I was one of the SEALs and all that sort of carry on in that. And now I do whenever, you know, I've been doing, I've done maybe about a dozen or so sort of very good movies, um, and now TV shows. Reality yeah. shows. Yeah, no, well, I've done reality shows as security, but I've also done TV shows like we did one in Colombia, Nine Months in Colombian Jungles doing a, a TV show for Apple Plus. Mm -hmm. And I've done, yeah, reality TV shows, providing security for the presenters and uh, whoever else, yeah. What do you think of the death of Bin Laden? Yeah, it raises questions. It raises questions, mm. you know. There's no way I don't think they didn't know he was there. Of course they did, you know, and they had him. He was a good little golden goose. Pakistan could get whatever they wanted until at such time he became, he wasn't worth anything. I heard his family own six or seven percent of America. Is that true? They own a large proportion of it, for sure. You know, um, there's a lot going on about that that we would never know. Like yeah. the Bin Laden jet was the only one allowed out of the US when everything else was the space was closed. <laughs> they they got them all out of there ASAP. You know, there's a lot that we we don't know about. Even nine eleven, but it's like a demolition. But you can go down that conspiracy route. Conspiracy route. You can go down that. Oh, for sure. You imagine the uproar if it all came it was all true that it was a set up to well, then but look at Iraq Iraq's prime example and what's the it was like a boat but it was all fake they'd faked a, a Vietnam Vietnam they'd faked a mm. boat yeah being blown up just yeah. the Bay of Tonkin I think yeah, it was Tonkin or some shit yeah yeah, um, yeah I don't yeah, know it's yeah. fucking like, I don't know but or Libya I mean you know Blair had welcomed Gaddafi back into the fold However, you know, um, Sarkozy owed him seventy million dollars. He was also looking to uh, he was also looking to stop using the U.S. currency as the uh, as the gold standard. He wanted to bring in an Arab standard, and fuck, there's no way they were going to let him have that. You know, so they took him out. And the things that he done for his people as well, with the health care and health care, education, and education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And they were going on. Well, yeah. Well, he sponsored terrorism. Yeah. Well, okay. If I could. Or stand up if you haven't sponsored terrorism, there'll be nobody standing up. That is crazy, though. Yeah. When did you start questioning it all? Really questioning it all and questioning everything the, behind uh, it? The Iraq. Iraq? Yeah. Iraq. But why, like Tony Blair and that, like, he's definitely got like, blood in his hands. Like, how? It's just fucked up. But again, that's power, that's parliament, that's politics. They cover for each other. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. 
and it'll never get brought down because people are too naive. Yeah, yeah. When you have a million people protesting in the middle of London and they still just fucking ignore you and just do it anyway, you know? They don't care. They don't care. Too much money. Too much money to be made. Yeah, look with yourself. You were there six hundred dollars a day. Yeah, they're they're earning fucking six million a day or whatever it is they're exactly. earning billions a day. Yeah, Do you think they give a fuck? Yeah, and that's the question of life. But again, we don't have all the answers. See, so see when you started writing your book, was that the first time you felt like therapy? Is that you felt a little looser? Yeah, yeah, it did. You know, and I I I regretted it to be honest because, like I say, it kept kicking the sand. But it's opened up avenues like yourself where i can talk and and i've done a few podcasts um where and my first couple of ones are fucking terrible i had no idea how to do them <laughs> you know sort of um but the more people that listen to them i'm I, I don't even realize that perhaps someone gets something out of it and then they'll contact me and they'll say oh yeah this was this really helped me with that and and then i'll go well in fact i didn't realize you know and mm -hmm. if i can do that by talking about it um you know, fucking look at my background. You know, I come from New Zealand. I'm, I'm a fucking Maori. You know, we're hard bastards. I played rugby. I was in the fucking SAS. I was, I go to wars and all that sort of shit. And I can still cry over a fucking 10 year old eating a pigeon. You know, so people who, and particularly men, particularly males, and I think males nowadays as well, it's not all about being a hard bastard. You know, I was in Starbucks today and this young kid in a track actually comes in and he's got headphones and he kicks the chair and he sits down like he owns the fucking place. He weighs nine stone fucking wet. He's a hard bastard, but he's not. Uh -huh. He's hiding something. You know, he, he's, he's compensating for something. You know, and if you can see people who, who you think, you know, they wouldn't cry, well, fuck yeah, they would. You know, my father was a classic example, John Wayne mentality. Men didn't cry, you know, and, you know, that's just the way they were brought up. Men didn't cry. Too fucking hard for that. And never saw him cry. You know, and I kind of think, did that fuck me up or would it have fucked me up if I did see him? You know, so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is for that one. But now it's it's more, if you can make it more socially acceptable that, yeah, perhaps men do go through these struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, it might help another you know, a generation down the road or people who are listening. Where do you go forward for the future? Go back to my hill and shoot any country who tries to come from the time. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> I would love to... Um, I would love to see this into a, uh, a mini series because there's so much in it that I don't think a movie would do it justice. Um, I would like people to look at it and, and read it, and uh, particularly who have people or friends or family members who have gone through PTSD, because it's not a shoot 'em up book. It's a book about what I went through. It does have shoot 'em up in it, sure, but it's not one of these fucking you know, American sniper type. We were the best and all that sort of carry on. It's about the struggles. I went through, I put everybody else through, and, and they went through. So I would like that to be perhaps, I, I, I have friends all over the world, so I can't do it in every language. It's just, just impossible. But at least something with a, a film or a TV production that can perhaps get that message across as well. Mm -hmm. For anybody that's struggling right now in life, what advice would you have for them? You're not alone. You're not alone at all. And if you have an avenue to, to talk to somebody, you should. Um, you know, just when you think no one is out, out there for you, you know, there are. And, and, it's, and it's people that you perhaps don't even know. And, and you're bringing out the best in both yourself and the other person trying to help you. Just do not think you're alone because you're not. What do you think with Russia and Ukraine now? What do you think is happening? Russia's going to take the, uh, the, uh, the land that they occupy. Ukraine, I don't think, is going to get it back. And they're just going to have to say, okay, you know what, we can't sustain this. You know, we can't keep fighting this. The West can't keep financing us. We've got, now that they're looking towards Israel and Gaza all the time, you know, the US is making themselves so weak and so isolated over this. The Ukraine's just going to have to say, you know what, take what you have, leave us alone. How would you think of Palestine and Israel? Israel's going to start, they're, they're kicking a the hornet's nest, I think. You know, they're trying to drag in others. They're, they're, they have made it, I believe, unwinnable for themselves you know Israel's no longer going to be taken seriously on the, on the world stage the Arab countries are, are sort of like now going to be forced into a corner as to what they they want to do to help Gaza and all this 
you know, Israel was attacking other countries, Syria, Lebanon, you know, and people are getting sick of it, you know. There's only, America's denying it. I don't like Trump, but I don't like Biden either. You've got two silly old men, but Biden hasn't done anything to, to try and stop this because he's dictated by the people who make all the bombs. You ask not, because you, people say one man's, one man's freedom fighters, another man's, man's terrorists. Terrorist, is that yeah. what that is, yeah? Yes, yeah. Do you look at that as well? Because it's a true saying, isn't it? Is it is, totally true. Yeah, totally true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucking life, brother, isn't it? Mad it's, what it takes us. I think it's never, it's never ending decreasing circles until it's such time as that we put ourselves down in the, down, down the sinkhole. If you were president, a prime minister, what changes would you make to make the world a better place? You know, if a president, you know, and they, here's my first sort of problem with the president of the United States as a title or whatever, okay, and they say they're the most powerful president, as much as I, I appreciate what uh, Putin does with, with Russia as, as, a, as a leader. If you take the top job in any company, you know, CEO of whatever, Exxon, they're not around anymore, but say BlackRock, anything like that, you have to have a history of working in that country and in that industry. The US political system, you don't. It's a popularity contest. You know, if you can get enough people to like you for the time that you're campaigning, you now become the most powerful man in the world. You know, that, that's ridiculous. You know, you, you think with, you would have to have a history in politics to, in order to be able to take the top job and say, yeah, I think I know what I'm doing. All right. My political ambitions, if I were to have any, would be to clean up New Zealand first. It fucking needs it. You know, I'd bring in a lot of things that a lot of people wouldn't like, but I think more people would like because we've had governments try to clean up New Zealand and some not even bother, just make it worse. It needs to basically be stripped right back to an age where, okay, this is this is what I know works. We need corporal punishment because, I mean, I was a kid. If I, I didn't do shit because I knew I was going to get the strap or the cane. You know, there is none of that anymore. There's no respect. What would I do to try and change the world? Yeah, I really don't know if, if it would make a difference, you know. <laughs> I don't think it would make a difference. How are you feeling today telling your story? Well, you know, it is tiring. Uh, it is good. I'm always a little bit apprehensive whenever I, I do these and the more I've done it. And I knew I, because you have such a huge audience and you're so well known in the circuit for these podcasts, I was, I was a little bit sort of apprehensive. I didn't want to break down, which I did. So I fucked that one up. But I um, I wanted to get the message across, and your platform is, is fucking amazing to be able to do that, um, that you're not alone, you know, and there's, you know, you, there's, you can be a hard man, but you can also be a man. And, a, and being a man doesn't mean you're a hard man all the time. You know, yeah. you can be a father, you can be a, you can be a soft man, you can be an emotional man, you know, and you just got to know how to, apply it and for how long and then and do what you you are put on this planet to yeah. do like you say people can be out there working 95 providing for their family doesn't like any violence any conflict whatsoever will be stronger than the man who's maybe killed 10 or 20 people doesn't everybody defines being a man differently defines success differently we all define the world differently as long as you're not harming anyone yeah and try to be the best man that you can be, by all means, you're fucking winning. I think we're all struggling because we're all competing against each other. I think everybody's got a better life, but everybody I've interviewed, all these influencers and this and that, they're all fucking struggling more than anybody. Yeah. All these people on Instagram and there are OnlyFans girls, they're all struggling. I've no, dis I've no disrespect towards these girls. They're choosing that life. Fucks it, you've killed people. I used to fucking love cocaine and alcohol and gambling. I fucking loved that. I've made many mistakes, but... That's the path we were on at that moment. It's led us to who we are today. You're doing talks, you've got a book out, you bring movies. You probably become a better father, a better husband because of all the shit and torment that you've been through. So life's never over for anybody watching. Dig deep, yes. make some sacrifices, make some changes, but fucking by all means you can change. And that's the, the bottom line. Baza, would you like to finish up any, on anything else, brother? No, mate. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, James, it's, it's been a fantastic experience. I want to thank you very much. Um, you know, I'd just like to say to to people watching or listening, I mean, look at the book. It's not about fucking killing people or whatever. It's about the struggles we, we go through 
and how I dealt with mine, they're all different, but you can sort of like use it as a, as maybe a self-help or even a sort of just to get a glimpse that, you know, you're not alone, you know, you're not fucking out there. And just when you think shit's really bad, if I can call somebody, help them out. I'm just really honoured to be here and thank you very much. Anything, brother. Baza, listen, wish you all the best for the future, brother. Thank Good you, luck. Man. God bless. Thanks, James. Thank Cheers, you. man.